Hello and welcome everyone at 2022 FIDE Women's Candidate Tournament Pool B. Sorry, Pool A, not Pool B yet. It's going to be just a month later, but now here we are in the semifinals, game two. And I am Women Grandmaster Kerry Tatalashvili. I'm joined with Grandmaster Arthur Nexions. Arthur, hello and welcome. How are you feeling today? Hi, okay, Kerry. It's an absolute pleasure to be back after this uh, very exciting day yesterday of round, not round, but the first game of the match. And yeah, the action continues uh, of the uh, so-called mini-match because uh, in case you missed what happened previously in the FIDE candidate cycle for women players, this is the so-called semi-final match. And I think it's a good time to have a look at the bracket. And here you see that Anna Mazachuk already beat Konero Hompi in a very exciting match. Uh, in the quarterfinals, at once into the semifinal, yesterday they played a very interesting strategical game, which finished in a draw, where the Chinese Gramster was seriously pressing uh, Anna, but was able unable to capitalize. And of course, the second pool or the so-called pool B will be held later. I believe the correct dates are 28th uh, November until 11th December in Uzbekistan. Yep, I uh, I traveled into the time a bit <laughs> and mixed the pools. But let's take a look right now at the match. Lei Tingzhi against Anna Muzichuk. They have not played much of the classical games. They have played uh, mostly blitz and rapid games. And we can really speculate with the result. The first game here yesterday was a draw. It was a nice game. Although it looked quite equal. It was not draw until the very end and Lei was pressing so much and I was in very uncomfortable situation. They are switching the colors today. So let's see what they gonna bring in the uh, match. But before we go very deep into the uh, statistics and the opening and so on and so on, let's take a look what these players are playing for and what is the budget of the tournament. And Arthur, this is number that we don't very often have in a women's tournament 250,000 euro is the total price fund where the winner will get 60,000 and then we do have runner-up uh 15,000 and each of the participants are guaranteed with 20,000 euros yeah it's absolutely so, impressive impressive prize fund and i think that's why of course all of the women players are trying to qualify for the candidates also there's the the unique possibility to become the strongest female player in the world challenging the reigning world champion Yuven Yun in the championship title because essentially this is what the candidates tournament is all about to bring out the next challenger to dethrone the champion that is right. Let's take a look once again at the format and what is the rules for this tournament. So we had eight players in Pool A that's going to be uh, also in A and B. And at this tournament, we had uh, four players at the beginning. Now we only have two uh, players left. They are fighting, as you mentioned, for the World Championship Um title and they will challenge one of these participants will challenge current world women champion Ju Wen Jun. So in the match, if one player gets two and a half points, that automatically means that this player will qualify in case of two, two, if they tie the match, then we might have the, we're going to have the tie breaks in the rapid uh, format, which is the uh, less time uh, for them on the clock. But in these four games, they're going to have 90 minutes plus 30 seconds. And then after 40 uh, moves, they're going to have half an hour increment on the clock so right now we can see both players are at the board we can see some people walking on the background i guess they are the special guests now who's gonna pick the first move today as i understand before every single game there's a special guest who executes the so-called honorable first move which is not really legally binding but uh yeah sometimes the player choose what was chosen by the guest yeah, so 
yeah, I think every day we have new, new person making the first move and the photos. Today's guests are Stefan Lemote. I excuse for my French, probably did not write it correctly. And this person is someone who um, helped and was a sponsor to the uh, Simo, which has happened some time ago in Casino de Monte Carlo. Um, uh, there was the Simo when uh, women chess players uh, played against the guests and it was a uh, quite huge event and also Monte Carlo is well known uh, of the place which supports the women in chess and we have seen here a lot of a lot of high uh, high titled women tournaments another guest Arthur is very interesting uh, this is a person who wrote a chess book um, and this is a manga. I don't know if you or if our viewers have heard of this. I've never heard of this. This is Japanese comic uh, uh, theme uh, book. And uh, he wrote chess about chess and uh, he uses chess as a main theme. Uh, so guys, if you are curious, what is this book about? You can check it out. The name of the book is Blitz and uh, you can let us know how it actually sounds and how it actually looks. And did you spot it, Kerry, here? Litting G actually chose to play D4. She showed the honorable guest to play D4. And we had some slight speculation. What is going to be the first move for Litting G? She chooses E4, D4 equally. But in this for the candidates woman cycle, she has been exclusively playing D4. Now the moment of truth. Is she going to play D4 once again? And the second <laughs> guest comes... Once again, chooses the queen spawn d4. Still doesn't mean anything because it is up to Lating G still to choose her first move. I think, Kerry, we might see d4, d5, and then maybe suddenly Lating G changes her mind and pushes e4. What do you think? Yeah, that's so, so, so interesting situation. We also see la uh, laugh from both players, and especially Lating G, she goes d4. I really thought she would swap to e4. Uh, because to be honest, I still didn't, did not know until this moment, which would be her choice if or or different, cause she plays equally those two moves. Like the percentage of the first move is 50, 50 to E4 and to D4. Um, and yeah, she did not trick the opponent at this time. All right. Let's check. I feel there's a surprise coming. G6. Now, now that's a big question. Is Anna here going for the Grunfeld? Because uh, as far as I know, the Grunfeld defense is one of the favorite defenses of the Ukrainian Grandmaster. However, you'll see again the stare in the eyes, right? She's trying to gather some information, intimidate the opponent. But exclusively in this tournament, Anna was consistently surprising her opponent, meaning in the first round when she was playing against Conor Humpy, she was playing... Uh, the first game, I believe it was, yeah, the first game, Queen's Gambit accepted, which she rarely plays before. And and then she chose pretty much every single game, the so-called semi Tarash, and that was her surprise. So these players are really, uh, I mean, top-notch. They they have done their homework, right? And a big mm -hmm. part of being successful is deliver this opening surprise. And I was guessing that maybe Anna might play the Grunfeld, but I think that Li Ting Ji wasn't absolutely sure it's going to happen. Yeah, interesting, interesting start of a day. Uh, so those two players are playing their main openings, as we know, and I love to play Grunfeld. And uh, yeah, Lei don't have much of the option to go against Grunfeld, but she can choose to go with a standard setup, classical setup, or just go to the other direction. Um, yeah well this is this is very interesting uh earlier we had a talk before the before the live like are gonna be there some surprises in the opening they will change something i kind of have a feeling that surprises are ahead of us in the tie breaks in this match maybe yeah i am still still not really sure how this match is going to turn out because i think that yesterday we had a very nice mm -hmm um inside how the match is probably gonna progress it's gonna be really fighting 
And uh, Anna didn't really get anything much out of the opening. She was looking for a quiet game. Remember yesterday, leading G with the black color chose to play uh, the Sharps, uh, Sicilian with C5 and E6. And uh, uh, Muzichuk decided to divert to a more quiet game. And then in the end, it was the Chinese uh, Grandmaster who was pressing for most of the part of the game. So here, uh, if you go back a couple of moves, maybe uh, I'll try to slightly explain the concept of the Grunfeld. Sure. Uh, Grunfeld uh, at the highest level has been around for, for as far as I know, really, right? I mean, Black is challenging white center, and if... Um, Black does nothing, why simply takes a lot of space. And this is where we enter the realm of the King's Indian, where white is enjoying really a good space advantage. And uh, doesn't mean that black cannot fight, but it's slightly cramped. So d5 is a very modern way to combat the center. And c takes 95 e4 is very common way for white to take the center. I mean, white secures the pawn center with a pawn on e4 and d4. It White can strengthen with most like knight of three, bishop e3, whatever, bishop c4, etc. And black tries to undermine. So in a nutshell, it's a fight for the center, the very basics of chess. So who is going to do better? Is white going to claim the center or black is going to destroy it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's always the question in this opening, indeed. Uh, Arthur here, uh, late played knight f3. Uh, she has games where she played queen to a4 instead uh, to give this check and there is a little bit of nuance there a little bit of difference like let's uh let's see if instead of knight f3 um white goes for queen to a4 all right uh, sorry instead of bishop bishop e3 she played uh she oh yeah here, here we go queen a4 check and here knight to d7 has been played in both games and now she played knight to f3 and um, after c5, then she decided to bring this queen back all the way to c2 uh, and to, uh, to have this queen over here and to play this kind of opening here. And yeah, game continent with queen to c7, uh, bishop e2, and so on and so on. Uh, so there was in her database, and for sure team Anna knew about it, and now she have changed her move order and she started with bishop to e3. Mm -hmm. And anyway, Anna, Anna fights back in the center with c5. White ignores that and plays knight to f3. Uh, uh, to be honest, in this uh, opening, what myself I have experienced with white pieces, if I'm not developing my king side, I might be a bit late and behind. And uh, black very, very least can uh, make a draw with this c takes d4 and then queen a5. So. I like this idea to develop the king side rather fast. Mm -hmm. Indeed. But I think that here's a number of ways how white can play it out. Uh, so bishop e3, knight of three is really one of the ways. Uh, I think that this is the most conventional way how white is developing the pieces, but also pretty popular. I think there's this idea to play bishop c4, c5, and knight e2. And with the knight on e2, that's a bit odd way to develop the knight. But what is really securing himself against this bishop g4 threat? Because the knight on e2 seems to be a very important piece to hold on the center, right? And mm -hmm. uh, obviously, bishop g4, you just play f3. So this is really a slightly different setup after bishop e3, c5, knight f3. Now, at every, every given moment, white needs to watch out bishop g4 because bishop g4, knight c6, Queen a5, the pressure on the pawns of d4 and c3 can mount really, really fast. Yeah, I agree with that. And Arthur here, uh, Anna plays queen to a5 and attacking the pawn on c3, which is hanging with a check. Uh, at, at this point, uh, Lei can make some, uh, some uh, choices. She can actually already played queen to d2 and did not sacrifice the pawn on c3 and instead she is uh getting ready for the uh for the end game are you do you think that we might have an another uh game with queens off the board like c takes d4 c takes d4 and queen trade it definitely makes sense yeah c takes on d4 c takes queen d2 now i think that what wants to recapture most likely with the knight 
I guess, I to play king. or king. Okay. okay. King is the yeah one of the main uh, main moves here because Arthur, if you take with the knight, the knight c6 comes with the tempo on d4, right? And Probably. this king is funny looking in the center, but then white develops this bishop, bishop c4, bishop b5, rook d1, and then you can play king e1, and you are just on time. That's actually a very valid point. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I wasn't really sure what to recapture. I know that sometimes uh, the king on these, though, for white is pretty bad. Sometimes it's good. But what is really trying to make good of these central pawns? You know, Keddy, I remember one thing. Here after queen a5, I think it was here. Probably you're going to correct me. There is a very notorious mm -hmm. way how you can make a draw. I think it was knight e2. Now, the yeah. big point is... After knight e2, queen c3, you have this very nice trick rook c1. And white is, I yeah. guess, sort of claiming an advantage because recaptures the pawn on c5, enjoys the center, wins a lot of tempos, you name it. And now the big point mm -hmm. is, after the short castle, if white is not really interested to fight, white can play knight v3, force black to take it, and this leads to quite an infamous draw. So there is no way that none of the players can continue. And this is a very legal way how you can make draw. <laughs> Both of the players are perfectly happy with the result. And actually, I'm quite happy it didn't happen. And instead here, if you go back a move, uh, Queen D2 was played by Leiting G. And after Knight C6, Rook B1 and A6 is on the board. Yeah, that would be the shortest working uh, day for us. <laughs> for me, the shortest working day was half an hour, which I did it with Anna Rudolph, and both of us were so exciting, excited to work together, and the game ended in about 20 minutes. So overall, working hours for us was just half an, half an hour, and it was quite disappointing for everyone uh, and uh, also for the viewers everybody wants to see fight no one wants to have like drawish games and i already see in our chat on twitch that people wants to see a fight you know Kenny, if we go back here i, I think this definitely this is going to be a fight but i noticed this very odd move by white i mean rook b1 I guess targeting the b5 square, rook b5, or bishop b5, I guess rook b5. And after a6, sort of lose the tempo of rook c1. And as far as my very limited knowledge from the white's perspective against the Grandfell goes, white sometimes enjoys this weakness that black created, meaning the square on b6. For example, mm -hmm. there could be there could be lines. For example, let's say black decides to take it, take it, take on d2, king d2, and for example, let's say castle, right? White could make a very good use of this square on b6. Sometimes there's ideas like bishop b6 and the absence of the black pawn controlling the weakness on b6 could be important in some moments. So this is really deep stuff, to be honest, rook b1 and then rook c1. Yeah, that's uh, that is uh, surely the theory. Otherwise, you would not lose uh, to Tempe in the opening, uh, unless you know what you're doing, right? And unless you have tested already, if that's correct. For the moment, we have Queen trades, and that's the moment that you have to capture with the King. There's not much of the choice, and Leg goes for that. So far. They are blitzing out the moves, especially Lei. She has one hour and 33 minutes increment, extra increment on the clock. Anna is a little bit more careful uh, by choosing the moves. She's not surprised with this today, right? I cannot, I'm sure she's not surprised uh, for, for this moves and uh, she can surely spend more time to choose the lines because um you can make decision to trade the queens at the very early or you can just keep uh, keep the game going on and keep the queen on the board choose some other uh moves and um and just play that uh, okay. but here we have decent game and um my my thought is like why uh anna choose to go here uh arthur i i understand why lego goes in here because it's just a slightly better when you have nice center well-developed pcs but black pieces are not so good looking here i, I think getty uh, mainly at the competitive level the ground field is widely regarded as a drawing weapon i mean mm -hmm. it might feel a bit paradoxical to some of you viewers because it seems that ground is very aggressive 
Now, I, I, I have talked with quite a bit of professionals and uh, they all say that, right, indeed, uh, you can get a pretty sharp game from the black, but very often those lines lead to some mass trades, equalizing lines. So this is like a very aggressive way how I think uh, Muzichuk is trying to uh, obviously secure a draw and thus equalize uh, her uh, spoiled white color, if I dare to sp uh, say that, uh, mm -hmm. yesterday. And I find also quite odd that the queens again have disappeared from the board very quickly because yesterday, maybe, Kerry, you can tell it immediately which move was it. I don't remember the count, but here already move 12 and the queens are gone. So that's it. Very quick. The players are training the queens and relying on their positional skills in the middle game in a queenless game. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yesterday uh, in the game, they also traded the queens rather fast. It was move 12 in that case. Uh, but before before they reached to move 12, they have spent uh, more than half an hour because we remember it was a surprise for Anna. It took her some time to remember the line and to know how to react exactly. But uh, today they made this decision rather fast, and uh, this is also move twelve. So <laughs> this looks somehow faster, but it's the equal equal move uh, moves when they uh, traded the queens. E six is played by Anna Mozachuk, and I guess the idea is to stop d five. So, for example, mm -hmm. if she wouldn't play d six, e six, and would play uh, castle instead, I think there's got to be something like d five. Let's say d five. An e5, uh, probably white is going to take it and just claim some very minor pressure because the king is in the center. There could be something like f4 or uh, maybe bishop b6 or bishop d3. And also, I think we have to mention one of the core ideas in the so-called endgame. So let me go back here a moment and explain you the concept. So why black is going here and why white is going here? So white is claiming the pawn center, right? You have very good pawn center. And the big idea at some point is to play d5. At some point, establish a pass pawn. And then you want to push it as far as possible and maybe get something in the process. Now, black has uh, pawns here on the queen side. So black is really hoping to withstand the middle game. And then if you remove all of the pieces from the middle game, we have a pawn end game. I think actually black already has a lot of better chances because black can organize the so-called outside pass pawn at some point, And it becomes really a menacing thing compared to why it's very strong center. Yeah, I agree with that. So it's it's in end game but they both have some ideas and the one who starts to implement the idea first will have just a slightly better position arthur i was curious what happens instead of e6 if black develops the bishop because this bishop on c8 is not good looking bishop and it's actually very interesting what can happen after this move white will push d5 because black wants to capture the knight on f3 and then pawn and after d5 here black plays rook to d8 to pin the pawn uh, as white's king is in the center and can high rather fast black wants to play next move e6 and now white has bishop a6 crazy move wow uh, so, well, here wow bishop a6 yes, bishop a6 so if you take this bishop back i'll take rook to c6 thank you very much i got a pawn a6 pawn is hanging i have beautiful center in my all pieces are well, well developed. I will bring the rook from h1 to b1, c1. This is pretty much very close to be game over for, uh, for, for black. So instead of taking on a6, black can complicate a little bit here with e6. Bishop a6. And now e6, black wants to ignore everything and take the um, pawn on d5. And now what can have... White has several moves, yeah, bishop b7, but white can go bishop b6 and bring more storm on the board. Bishop to b6 to hit the rook if you leave the uh, d8 square. Now, um, king can go on e2, I believe, and that's pretty much it. He wants to, or bishop b5, for instance, to uh, pin the knight or king to e2. Uh, but instead of rook to d7, black can play bishop h6, right? To give a check and <laughs> to this? get the rook. <laughs> so then uh, white plays king to e2. 
black text to rook on c1, white text to rook on d8, and now knight takes on d8 to get rid of this c6 square. And now uh, bishop to b5 is a very strong check. King goes somewhere on e7, f8, and now you take the bishop, and white has here big advantage. Uh, what is this? Is this theory? It's uh, it's just a line that I checked and I was like, whoa, we need yeah. to see all of this and we have to remember all this because to me, bishop g4 looked the most natural move and I asked myself, why not that? And I played rather fast, mm -hmm. this movie six. Looks to me more passive uh, than bishop g4 and this lead, lead, lead us to that crazy variation. And sometimes also this knight a5, I think now you start to appreciate of this early, including rook b1, rook c1, Remember, right? There is already mm -hmm. the idea to play bishop b6, which probably doesn't work immediately because of this very nice check on h6. But white could just make some kind of a move here first, which I don't know what's going to be. For example, remove the rook, maybe rook c7, and then suddenly bishop b6 becomes a threat. But the pawn on a7, this is not a threat. So once again, you have to really appreciate the fine details that here white is showing here once again it was here rook b1 threatening with uh rook b5 uh forcing black to play a6 and then calmly responding with rook c1 anticipating that after knight a5 in some lines you have bishop b6 i mean it's just incredible it is really. Uh, I have to admit, Arthur, that when I played Greenfield as a kid, I could never understand why I have to play Rook to B1. And for me, I'm a player who likes to castle first and then to play all these Rook moves. And I, 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 di I didn't understand it really. Why Rook B1? Or then uh, why two rook c1? Then I understood that the rook, rook b1 is for rook b5. But the main point is this b6 square. And in this game, we're going to see more variations where b6 will be a hole for black and while white will try to take advantage of that. And in this uh, crazy line after bishop g4, we have seen this happening, right? Right. That white occupied b6 square. So that's a little detail that uh, it's good to know and good to implement in the game. Mm. Now I now I wonder what what is gonna do. So I assume that uh, either leading g is already after the book, mm -hmm. or she's trying to remember, or she's choosing between the plans. So probably one of the most natural ideas I can think of here is something like bishop d3. You bring out the bishop, I guess the black is in a castle. And then I guess you play something like king e2, rook d1, and try to make good of your uh, pawn break mm -hmm. in the center. Although, of course, you need to properly evaluate uh, how you're going to keep this pawn alive. It's something like rook d8, and the pressure is pretty serious. However, there's also one more idea in the Grunfeld, specifically because black lady is six. And this is a really tricky one because it can go both ways. And that is e5. So mm -hmm. e5, you secure a lot of dark squares under your control. So I'm talking about like knight g5, knight e4, knight e6 at some point. But it comes at a great expense because if black mm -hmm. takes control of this d5 square and lands a knight or a bishop, I think black is almost enjoying an extra pawn at the queen side. So it's not really so simple. It is not so simple, and I, I read in the in the comment, puzzles for breakfast says, I'm glad you guys are talking about this rook b1 that you, you just explained, Arthur. I was just playing it because it was theory and never knew why. You are not alone, puzzles for breakfast. We have been, all of us, in that kind of situation. And uh, yeah, not often we have the opportunities to really know why we're playing certain moves. Some of them are so obvious, but some of them are not. And yeah, and it's... Um, it feels so good when you, when you learn why you made this move. And right. What is what is hidden inside? Uh, bishop to d3 has been played. This is one of the um, main um, move in here, mostly played move. And after here at this point, what White can um, also do is h4 because we do like Grunfeld with the h4. Uh, h4 is something that I would be a little bit careful though, like maybe rook to d8 and then e5, the move that you were mentioning. This is really interesting. I think it's uh, most likely we are going to see something like this. Uh, probably either h4 or first king mm -hmm. e2, rook d8, then e5. And it's going to be a clash of ideas. 
because black is going to try to occupy this square, maybe b5, it should be 7, 95, something, and try to steer the game towards the end game. Because remember what I told you, dear viewers, black has this pass pawn, the chance to organize the outside pass pawn on the queen side, while this d pawn is blocked. While white is trying to organize some sort of an attack at the king side through these dark squares, maybe bishop g5, maybe h5, double the rooks, and who said there can't be a checkmate without a queen on the board? <laughs> yeah, it can be, really, can be. Who can, who can stop white if there is an open h file and two rooks out there? Oh, the bishop on g7 for the moment gonna, uh, is holding things together, that, but there are lots of ideas that white can play. I'll, I'll maybe five, show. Five, I'll maybe show very quickly. For example, just okay, one, let's do it. Just one sample line. Can things can go very badly wrong for black? Okay, I think I missed my rook here. Let me just just make some random moves, really. So here, 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 and that's a checkmate. So wow. really, really rough idea, right? So you get a bishop g5, mm -hmm. bishop f6, rook h8, rook h8. Also, there's a knight g5 idea at some point. And that's why it's not really so simple. And black is going to want to have a very good uh, uh, response to this h4 because h5 is really invitation. h4 and h6, probably you could regret it in some men games after h5 g5 if white gets the knight on g4 but again i'm already running too much forward <laughs> yeah we might see something like this if late decides to push h4 at some point yeah black has to make the decision and here we have the moment we mentioned about the move she goes for that very aggressive approach from lay ting g she has no queen on the board but still going for the king side attack mm, yeah now let's check on us um um expression she is clearly trying to remember this is the typical pose you try to remember when you close your eyes you look down you are trying to recall what was in that file. What was in that file? Definitely H4 should not be a surprise. This is a very no. typical move for the Grunfelds to open the H file. Anna should know this. And now the big question is, does she remember or not? Because this is just one of the possible lines that White can choose. And there is, of course, this very minor chance that Anna had this position right before the game at the hotel room prepared by her coaches, and she plays very quickly. So the answer is very obvious. She knows. She knows it. Of course she knows it. Uh, well, Grunfeld is her, her main opening, and she is a very active player. She's playing online tournaments. She's playing over the board tournaments. And uh, nowadays, H4 movies quite challenging for Greenfront players right so uh, i was i was sure that she would uh, she would play rather fast and she was ready for this kind of pawn attack and as we have now rook on d8 and the pawn on d4 is hanging uh here let's try to find solution for for white to guard this pawn one is e5 which we mentioned another is rook to c4 and is that a way that white can hold the pawn with this rook uh maybe i mean it looks a bit weird uh okay i don't really know uh what the rook is doing on c4 except to protecting the pawn but i guess the big idea for white is to go for this king set attack right h5 mm -hmm. and the way i understand it it probably at some point you want to double the rooks and that's why this rook on c4 sort of doesn't really fit in the picture but i understand it i mean black cannot easily attack this rook there's no b5 because the knight is under attack and if you play something like bishop d7, which is probably mm -hmm. a normal move, you remove pretty much half of the pressure from the center, which maybe Kete is still going to lead at some point after h5, d5. <laughs> and this rook from the fourth rank still makes it to h4. Ooh, I love that rook lift on the fourth rank. In fact, we do have rook to c4 on the board. They played very fast that move. 
um it's it's really uh strange and i just look at the clock i have a feeling that lay is making the move so fast but look at the time situation actually anna is the one who plays faster she has uh one hour and 27 minutes on the clock and lay has one hour 21 minutes on the clock uh so rook to c4 is the move definitely our anna was expecting and um let's see how fast uh, she will um answer if she is still within so the prep, the answer should be pretty mm -hmm. quick. I mean, rook c4 is um, uh, probably one of the most lo logical choices. There is, of course, this possibility, uh, if you go back a move before, that Anna played rook d8 very quickly because that's the most natural move. Maybe she already was after the prep. It's just a very logical move to attack the pawn on d4, gather some information, so it, this can't be a mistake, and now she's really trying to figure it out. However, if she's going to respond in something like one or two minutes, it's pretty clear that she is still within the preparation. Or maybe she's just, again, trying to remember. I guess we are going to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, here, what uh, uh, Black can do is, uh, for instance, bishop to d7, which we were talking about. Bishop to d7, h5, um, b5, or goes down on c1, probably. And now black can play this move rook to e8, very typical move in uh, Grunfeld where you can't find the square for the bishop and you play this uh, bishop on e8 square. D4 pawn is once again challenged. And now you're pretty much forced to push e5. Yeah, yeah. so here we might have this position. Uh, and Arthur, I was just curious, like white could play e5 right away, but played instead of this c4 and black played b5 black played bishop d7 and bishop d8 like i have a feeling black played way too more moves than white i think that white is uh gonna enjoy the fact that she can choose that to play e5 at the right time that's my feeling mm -hmm. that the e5 move is not going to go anywhere so for example if you play e5 like right away which probably is a very legit move maybe black can very quickly rearrange these pieces in the ideal squares, right? So first, I guess, deal with the threat of h5, play something like h6, then whatever, knight e7, knight e5, uh, b5, bishop b7, and black is perfectly ready for this setup. So I think also part of the idea why white is probably delaying this idea, because if black plays something like this, bishop d7, e5, b5, Rook C1, 97. I mean, like you said, Kerry, Black has wasted a couple of tempos for all of this. Mm -hmm. And now White can find the right moment to play E5 when 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 White wants. Okay, I think it was here. Bishop E8 and now E5. And now the position yeah. is not ideal for, for Black. And again, this is a very, very big threat. It is uh it is really a big uh, threat. Uh, um I was just looking very interesting game. Maybe we can just uh, show some a bit of that. So in that line after bishop d7, h5, b5, and white went rook to c1, bishop to e8, and at this point after e5, black can play f6 to strike back in the center and open up the uh, all these lines. Because uh, King is on D2, right? It's not still safe. Uh, here, white can take the pawn on F6. Bishop takes F6 and H takes G6. H takes G6. Right. And now, Bishop to G6. Oh, that wins the pawn by force, actually, does it? Or maybe... uh, well, if you take with the bishop back, then rook to 6 And this looks really nice to white. As you win a pawn, a six pawn is hanging, and like whole king side is gone. Uh, so you can take the pawn in d4. Uh, yeah. And at this point, uh, white can give a check on h7 with the bishop, king to g7, or king to f. It's better to play maybe king to f8 because there is rook c7 check uh, additionally. Oh my place. goodness, that is so deep. Okay, king of eight, yeah. Okay, yeah, but it does <laughs> make sense much. to just say rook c7 check. Okay, okay. <laughs> yes, and now it takes, takes it, but it's it's funny because this might also lead us to some kind of end game where it's equal still after all these moves. And rook know. to d8 here. Rook d8. Mm -hmm. No, white is definitely better. I think yeah. if, if we get something like this, white definitely seems better because white has the outside pass pawn. 
uh, White Chaos, very active bishop, a very nice centered king. And by the way, dear viewers, you might, this might be a surprise to some of you, king's also a piece. It's not only <laughs> something that you need to desperately defend, and here the king on e3 is controlling a lot of critical squares. This is the end game, so it's a full piece. And rook, ideas like rook c7 actually checkmate in one rook h8, combined with g4, g5 ideas, it just looks better for white, really. I mean, if this is uh, the position which has been played, as you say, right? Getting in one game already? Yeah, I saw this game has been played uh, already, but uh, let me check how, uh, what was the rating level in that game. Right. Yeah, just very quickly, I'm going to check that. Uh, but of course, f6 is not the only move that black can play. Knight b4 is another move that you can just, uh, you know, don't complicate the things. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was uh, played at 2400 level. 2400. Okay, Last so all of, year, yes. So all of this has been already played before, and that means it's a very, very good chance that other the players have seen it. I mean, they, they mm -hmm. have to have seen it, right? That this game, or at least their coaches, and yesterday we discussed who are the players that most likely um, are helping. And while yeah. Anna Muzichuk's uh, chess coach is uh, Ukrainian grandmaster Yuri Krivoruchko, who I understand is in Monaco right now, right? Yes. Also, yes, also right. she's helped probably by her younger sister, Maria Muzichuk, who unfortunately quit her journey to the World Championship title after losing to Li Tingji. And uh, Li Tingji's... Uh, helpers are unknown but i think it's a good guess that probably some of the if not all of the leading chinese grandmasters are in the team yeah uh first of all they have the restrictions still um to travel in europe and then uh lay lay told me that it's so difficult for her to travel back because she needs to have a peer test uh, PCR peer test. PCR. I I I, I, remember, I forgot already. Arthur, can can you can you imagine PCR test was something like so necessary thing for past few years. So, anyways, PCR test. She needs two days before. So, if she is out of the tournament and she has to leave next day, she cannot go. So, uh, as I know, the organizers um, allowed her and let her uh, relax about this topic and they gave her the uh, days in the hotel so she can stay until the uh, very end of the tournament because yeah obviously you cannot uh, you don't know when you're gonna lose the match right uh, so and then there is a quarantine when she goes back um, in China uh, and we had this conversation because uh, very often she's having dinner in the hotel and uh, other players, for instance, Muzichuk sisters are going in the casino and they have the uh, dinner in the restaurant and the casino, right? And they very much enjoy there. And Lei said that she's a bit careful because she doesn't want to socialize too much because she's afraid if she catches COVID, that's going to be a huge issue for her. Oh, wow. So, yeah, oh, she's a right. bit careful. There might be also, yeah, of course, uh, not only the health issues, I think also uh, there might be some stricter rules in China about yes. that. So I, I don't really know exactly them, but yeah, I can understand. Yeah, as she said, it was it's very strict rules. She's quite afraid of that, and she tries not to get in touch with the people too much and just have this private time. Uh, and that can be another reason that why she's not accompanied with the coach here. So it will be double risk for them. And uh, the, the other thing is that we, we don't know. It's secret and so we don't know who is preparing her. We don't know what will be her next opening choice. So that's quite a... Um, I mean, so far she's doing that... great in openings, right? Yeah. Uh, whoever her coach is, uh, he's doing a fantastic job. This idea of yesterday surprising um, Anna mm -hmm. with uh, the Sicilian. Today uh, she played the Grunfeld. She has a very nice position. Uh, apparently the checkmate ideas are on the board, despite the fact there's no queens. So mm -hmm. really interesting, interesting stuff. And also, by the way, while we are... Uh, waiting for the next move, Kelly. I think we also can mention to the dear viewers, uh, thank you for being here today. Um, uh, we are reading what you have to say about uh, the tournament, your insights, uh, your funny comments, etc. So if you have something really interesting to share with us, don't hesitate. and uh, We'll do our best to answer it when we have time. 
Yes, indeed, indeed. So um, here we have the moment of the silence from uh, from Anna's side. She took 10 minutes for this move, exactly 10 minutes, because last time we checked was 27 minutes uh, for her. So she is now um, probably calculating or choosing the lines. She can kind of stop this attack on the king side, right? With the h6, not h5, because if you play h5, you're gonna forever give up g5 square and you're gonna be under g4 threat anyway uh so h6 is another move she can play right now but now you could have some issues with the development of the queen side so rook b1 mm -hmm. you can't easily play bishop b7 or maybe you can actually look at that bishop b7 is very smart because now if you take it nothing is for free in this world not even the bottom b7 because after knight a5 <laughs> this is a very nice looking fork Oh, it's and if it's you a can't, trap. yeah, it's a trap. It's a very nice trap. So I guess White is not gonna take it and play something else. I I guess B five needs to be stopped with something like Rook B six, King E two, D five, and this is gonna be a very long positional game, right? So something mm -hmm. like King E two, probably Black is fine, but I have a feeling that Black is being slightly pressed, and the idea of E five is always in there. E five, Bishop E four and etc 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 yep so not so easy to make your decision i think i think this bishop d7 is more challenging for whites if you go bishop d7 and b5 and then after e5 you strike in the center with f6 that's more challenging for white and you're just trading more and more pieces I, I, I find actually Kitty to be slightly troubling for Anna that she has not yet played a move because the way I understand it, this has been played before. And uh, she either is not remembering it or she doesn't know it. So this is actually a bit risky because it appears to be that the late G is still within the prep. So you don't play h4, rook c4 without a prep. Although Lating G has spent 10 no. minutes on the clock, although she has, but definitely she knows yeah. the idea. Yeah, I hardly believe that Anna doesn't know the theory because she plays this forever and she's, uh, she's a very strong theoretician. Um, it's just for me i think it's just a pure calculation now she has time why not to use this time she's not in rush to make the move uh sometimes it gets a little bit unpleasant if we spend more than 10 to 15 minutes for one move we are just starting to mix the things in the lines um but um to think from the perspective as she was uh, having a bit unpleasant endgame yesterday and if she goes also very similar endgame today two days in a row to to be the side who has to defense it's not something that anna likes to do and used to do so maybe she is looking something different to go from this side Can and I? to go to the main thing can I try to be a bit more aggressive and play knight a5, b5, and sacrifice the pawn on c4 in some in some cases? So I don't know where this rook is supposed to go. Uh, could be rook c5 or c7. Okay, let's say mm -hmm. rook c7. And now I play something like b5 and knight c4 at some point. May maybe this is an idea, but to be honest, I'm slightly concerned it it's not going to be enough. Even if I play h5. Uh, uh, now you can play bishop to b7, I guess, and rook c8. You can make it on time. Right. And I now take it and take it. I don't know. This looks like something. Oof. Suddenly this pawn is under attack and you have to play something like rook of eight. And maybe white is simply not going to have the time. I'm sorry, black is not going to have the time to play rook c8. So there could be already some kind of a shot. Uh, right. So Arthur, after knight a5, is there a chance when you move your rook away, then black will plan to get this knight back on c6 and attack the pawn on d4? Oh, like this. Oh, wow. Hmm. And now if I play e5, 
Then you could trade my rook. Yeah, rook to seven, for instance. This is still a very rich game. Uh, I think that white is gonna launch the knight on e4 and e6, c5 a bit faster than black is gonna do it on d5. Mm -hmm. Combining with the ideas of h5, also there might be an idea at some point for white to play h5 and h6, which is right. a very unpleasant thing in an endgame, for example, let's say somewhere, let, let's say here, let's say here. Okay, maybe it's not the correct move, but uh, for example, after bishop f8, when we transpose the game very far in an endgame, this king is cut off and the pawn on h7 becomes a prime target. Yeah, that's actually true. Um, I have one very interesting suggestion. After knight c6, um here how about um actually it's not my suggestion to be fair i just <laughs> checked uh, with the engine <laughs> well, i'm lying to you so in this sense how about drew to b1 here to give up the pawn on d4 and that's very interesting because after you take everything let's show that rook takes now white can play rook to king to c3 um uh, not e3. You can also give uh, give e3. Uh, I think the idea of king c3 is that you you are also close to the queen side. And after rook goes back on d8, now rook to b6. And look at this position. Black's so paralyzed and um, so stuck. You cannot make much of the moves here. And white white can play e5, f4, g4, h5, all this move. Bishop e4. That's pretty looking. It's and, very uh, nice. Position. It's a very nice idea. I, I'm not sure if um, if this is a very obvious idea. I'm not sure how forced is all of this. I mean, knight a5, b5, maybe it's just a ridiculous idea. It's just mm -hmm. what I came up with. Uh, maybe knight a5 can be brought by Muzichok with the idea to push away the rook and then go back knight c6. So that's like an invitation to a draw. For example, let's say... Uh, let's say rook c1, knight c6, rook c4, knight a5, etc. So we make a trefal repetition and uh, call today. But this is very nice. So after knight c6, it's not very obvious, but rook b1 sacrifice a pawn like that. I like it. Yeah, the pretty, pretty looking idea indeed. Beautiful idea. Yeah. So maybe Anna already sees this and. Uh, that's why she's not really looking into knight a5. I mean, if she uh, she definitely is a big expert in the ground field. So then, mm -hmm. then uh, I think knight a5 is slightly odd looking move because uh, normally you don't want to place your knights on the edge of the board. They're not really doing anything there. It's just a problem with this b pawn. I mean, how do you play b5 bishop b7 without uh, creating some problems at the queen side? So bishop d7 closes. Uh, Right. The D file. So very, very big moment here for Anna. And that's why I, I do believe, Katie, probably you're going to back me up here, that in a, in a game, there's something like two, three critical moments. Two, three mm -hmm. critical moments which decide the fate of the game, where the game goes, left or right or forward. And you have to sit there and try to validate all of these nuances. And that's why this is the moment when a skilled player feels I have to invest time because you can't blitz it out. Rook d8 was easy. All of the previous moves were easy. e6 was, I guess, part of her preparation. And now you really have to make a very big decision here. I cannot agree more because this is the moment uh, where Anna already spends about 20 minutes. So uh, we have seen at least three candidate moves. All of them has the different directions, as you mentioned. One goes to the very, very end game. Another keeps the pieces on the board. Uh, other has more tactics. Uh, so it is not easy to make this kind of decision. And earlier yesterday, we were talking about what do you what is your goal in this game, right? What is the goal in, in the match? Do you want to make a draw black pieces? Do you want to fight uh, and try to win? So it's all all of these things together. And she knows it for sure, uh, more than we know. And that's why she's taking more and more time. And another thing uh, seems to me that she doesn't want herself to be in the same situation situation than she was yesterday. We saw her not happy at all um, with all this 
things that happening. And also we saw when Lei declined to repeat the position, that's not pleasant. And she doesn't want to have the same experience today as well. So yeah, she will avoid to have worse than the game indeed, but her time is ticking on the clock. She is having now one hour and seven minutes. And this is move 16 so far. It's it's okay, right? She can afford to spend twenty minutes. In she can afford, but but I but I think Eddie, she has to make a move at some point because according to my uh, experiences as a professional chess mm -hmm. player, I do believe that twenty minutes is already pretty much uh, for a move, and uh, when somebody, I mean. You might disagree with me. For example, there's very notorious cases like Grishuk, who can think for an hour. I'm not talking about very unique people. I'm talking about an average, average player, an average normal chess professional. Uh, if somebody is thinking for longer than 20 minutes, 30, 40 minutes, I think it's already a very good sign he is either confused or he has changed the mind. Because... Uh, I think that at some point, when you reach a certain position, you already have some sort of an idea. And then you get there, you try to work it out, you see something you don't like. And then you start to calculate, start to calculate, you start to seek something else, and time passes. So yeah. imagine yourself after 40 moves, if you still haven't made a move, there's a lot of confusion, right? Because you don't really like where the game is heading, you don't really uh, want to go there. But normally, I do believe about 20 minutes. 20 minutes is uh, what at least I'm trying to do is not to think longer than that for a single move. But sometimes it still happens. Yeah. It does happen. And we do have here move she heard H. Me. So yeah, she's like, okay, I'm going to wait until you, you've done your sentence and I'm going to make the move. Okay, okay. I know you guys need to need to commentate you guys need the moves and there's only one game you can't even switch so let me go and let me play h6 here which is the move uh to me this is something that she's still waiting here like Lei is the one who has to make choice like to play on the king's side to push h5 or maybe i don't know g4 sometimes or to switch the game on the queen side and bring this rook on b1 as we were showing earlier I think this concept is uh, good uh, that Black has chosen. The idea is definitely to meet h5 with g5, to remove white the attacking chances. And I think either we are going to see something like e5, bishop e4, or we were having a look at this line once again. So bishop b1, try to paralyze Black's queen side. Once again, enjoying this very nice square of b6. So going back to the opening part, rook b1, rook c1, provoking Black to play a6. Now you see the fruits of this. And what was it? Bishop d7 with the fork idea, if black is careless. And now some kind of a move. Some kind of a move. Let's say rook b6, uh, mm -hmm. bishop e8, uh, whatever. King e2 maybe. And black is trying to untangle. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah, I think that. Yeah, that actually makes sense here to me to have this bishop on e8 to very quickly get this bishop on e8. Maybe, maybe some of our viewers would ask, like, really, it's, it doesn't do much there. Maybe it was better on c8. It was at least guarding the pawn on b7. Uh, but in fact, uh, it's sometimes and in most of the times, it's better to have active pieces well-developed position rather than to have equal position. So my point is that you can sacrifice b7 pawn in order to have some activity, especially in Greenfeld system. And then that kind of positions are more likely to end in a draw or to have some nice of counterplay rather than to keep this bishop on c8 and wait forever for your opponent to prove you that you are worse. Because in some, in many cases, the opponent is capable to prove that. So I do like this idea: bishop d7, bishop b8, and then rook c8. And uh, engine also approves that. Mm, yeah, and uh, I think white most likely is going to be back with the ideas either to push d5, which I'm not sure how to really do it, or uh, try to switch this idea of e5. 
Uh, or maybe some sort of opponent wants but that other kings had something like g4, g5, establishing mm -hmm. some very I nice like control. Yeah, and then, you know, try to squeeze black, but one shot and black is going to be free. Something like rook c8, knight e4 might be a tactical shot at some point. So it's not like um, uh, black is also uh, having no active ideas, but I'm pretty sure we're going to see something like this. Uh yeah let's let's see now how much time lay will think here at this point uh was she ready for this move or not we're gonna learn it um i was actually thinking arthur is there a way white can uh, sacrifice the piece here like h5 g5 and knight g5 oh wow knight g5 now the big idea is that there's going to be but bishop g5 is always rook d4 mm -hmm. and h6 wherever i position the bishop i guess on f6 yeah if you bring this bishop on h8 white will have here the advantage oh d4 oh i missed something yeah there is h7 what did i miss and i think <gasps> oh my rook god d4? oh my goodness rook d4 look at that oh Oh, come on. This is never going to happen. Rook d4, knight e4, bishop g5. Bishop g5. And goodbye. <laughs> Can't uh, avoid bishop f6. Uh, the same applies here. Yeah. Okay, listen, this is not going to happen, Kerry. I mean, with all the excitement, yeah. of course, uh, it's a very nice trick, but... Uh... Yeah. Another uh, Arthur there after knight g5 and h6 g5. Black has to be very careful here. h6 and rook... Bishop h7 is also a bad move. Because uh, after that, you push h7, king goes on uh, f8, and now uh, the engine says e5 and enjoy your position. Bishop g5 comes next. Bishop on h8 is poor piece. Like, you can take this pawn, right? What is this? Uh, I, don't, I don't get it. Take king f7. What is this? It's some kind of a mess. I, I don't think it's very really likely we are going to see Rook that. h6, probably. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Rook h6, bishop g5. Okay, you know, bishop maybe. g6. No, but this is this is never going to happen. This is never going to happen because after knight g5, h6, h6, I think there's at least bishop f6. Bishop f6. Yeah, now white can play rook to h5, I guess, to still get this pawn. But in the end of the day, is that enough for a piece? And yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just don't believe in this attack. I just don't believe it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it is possible to blunder, but uh, <laughs> maybe I'm a blitz game. Maybe then blitz game. Uh, and yeah. rook b1, by the way, has been played. Bishop d7 blitzed out by black. So clearly, uh, both players are aware that kingside for the moment is closed for business. There's nothing happening. And now it really depends what's going to happen at the queen's side. So either rook b6 stopping black's b5 idea or or something else no i think it's got to be rook b6 yeah rook b6 sounds, uh, uh, seems the move that you are stopping the b5 coming forward otherwise uh arthur we have to play a4 and this a4 might be the target for black yeah at yeah. some point to play knight a5 attack the rook and the pawn at the same time we don't want to give up so much on the on the queen side or maybe even bishop e8 yeah bishop e8 yeah. you still keep the idea of rook b7 knight a5 there could be also some b5 ideas tacticals you take on b5 and there's some sort of a discovered attack by the knight something like knight e4 now i think a4 probably is something that white is not going to do because white wants to keep this pawn here and not to trade it uh, for the uh, b pawn oh pardon me yeah this is okay, the, uh, so this, this is the position. Bishop to d7. Oh. Oh, why is it uh, refreshing what's happening here? Okay, this is the final position. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, I'm wondering here if black needs to play at some point king e2. Not really sure. It's a very sensible idea to remove the king from right. the so-called x-ray. Yeah, that's an interesting question indeed. Do we need to do so um, or not? Because uh, 
basically in some positions maybe it's better to play e5 in king to c3 maybe to have this king stronger than to have on the other side but king e2 looks more natural I, now to play king c3 it's it's too much i with think all this Getty, on while, the board. while while we are gonna wait for the next move this is a very very good moment to take a, our very first break there you go rook b6 has been played and uh, the action is only starting their viewers uh, this is only what what's been the first hour of the game of the semi-final uh of the fitted candidates matches for women second game between maria sorry my mistake adam was a choke against letting g trying to qualify for the match of the world championship title get it Salashvili and me our donations we're going back in several minutes don't go anywhere make a cup of coffee or tea or something what you prefer and see you in, in a bit your subscription makes shows like this possible, which is why our Twitch subscribers will never see ads on chess.com. Connect your chess.com account and Twitch account at go.chess.com slash connect accounts and bang, boom, voila, you're done. 100% ad-free bliss forevermore. Whether you're following our events on site or on stream, type the command connect in the chat and thank you for helping bring these shows to life.
Welcome back, everyone. This is 2022 FIDE Women's Candidate Tournament Pool A semifinals. And on the screen, we see Anna Musachuk and Lei Ting Ji. Uh, they're facing each other. This is the game two out of four. And so far, we do have one draw in the first round. Second game has started at 3 p.m. Central European time and we are having very interesting position but before we get back into the game let's take a look at Anna's profile and know her better and what's very interesting how she got in here how she qualified in this tournament so she is 32 years old and she's ward ranked number seven by the rating and she's one of the few female chess players who has uh, crossed 2600 rating barrier for now she has 2534 rating and uh, she qualified because she got top three at the world cup and that's another way for the qualification to this tournament. We can talk a lot about Anna Muzicic and the Mario Muzicic because those are one of the very strong chess family and uh, very strong chess sisters who are grandmasters. And they, this is the highest chess title you can achieve. And both of them are in fact the world champions. So Mario is world champion in classical chess. Uh, Anna is world champion three times in Rapid and Blitz. Uh, so that's a lot of titles they are holding. And what's very interesting, they are uh, training together, but they have so different and unique style from, from each other, right? Right. And they, I, as I understand correctly, they have the same coach, right? Uh, also here in this uh, tournament, but they are a bit different personalities as well, as I understand it. Anna is a bit more quiet and uh, Maria is a bit more expressive uh right uh, also uh, it's the other other way though to be honest in the, real the other life, way i, I thought it's, other, yes. i thought what you said yesterday no <laughs> it's the other way no? like I, it's on this tournament anna is very focused and that's what oh. i was like uh so so surprised like i'm not surprised that she's, she's very focused just uh when it comes to the competitive chess Oh, she's right. so so serious, so focused, and um, in in real life, it's it's opposite, absolutely opposite. She's uh, more open, and uh, yes, it, they have so different characters, and it's so sweet to see them together. And uh, uh, how different is like one topic, and how different approach those two sisters have. It's 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 very very precious thing to say indeed um another very interesting uh, uh fact about Muzuchuk sisters is that um both parents of them are chess coaches and also chess players so um so chess it's has a family been in with the a family. lot of chess tradition yeah yes all right chess has been in the family for for years and years and sisters had very difficult year um not only the pandemic time that it affected to all the players but then uh, they had to leave their country they had to leave their home uh, and move to other country to the new uh, society a new place and that's something which is uh, not pleasant to anyone and then imagine you have to play in the competitive chess and you have to fight for the title so that has been truly the challenging years uh, year for uh, for them both of them and um yeah, very, very happy to see them fighting as they used to be in the previous years. Right. And I think also Anna is really, really looking towards this candidate cycle because unlike her younger sister, Maria, she has never been a world <laughs> champion in classical chess. So I always thought if somebody is going to be a world champion, I'm at least faster, it's going to be Anna because she uh, still is one of the very few uh, women players to... Uh, reach over 26 hunger than it was her yes. sister who surprisingly won the championship a couple of uh, years ago so there you go there's the chance actually i think that many players many fans in the world were expecting the clash of the sisters in the mm -hmm. uh, uh, semi-final of the uh, 
of, of the of the candidates match, but it didn't happen because Maria lost her match against Li Ting Ji, who is playing today against Maria's older sister. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. In fact, uh, I was myself also curious how this match could go, like how it's gonna end in the end. They're gonna fight, they're gonna play after the tie breaks. And another question was like, they have one coach, so then what's gonna happen in that case? Uh, but as I know, they are very supportive sisters and um, I'm sure that it would not be it would not be a big challenge as we think it might be. I think they would just enjoy to play against each other, and uh, yeah, that's that could be the best scenario for them, indeed. All right. Uh, now, talking about that, um, do we have any more news in the game? I don't think so. I think Bishop E8 uh, was played by Anna. Uh, so here, Leiting G has a deeper thought. Rook B7 is still impossible because of Knight A5. Now, the big question is how White is going to advance. How do you do it? Can we, can we try the... to make, work some scenarios here? Uh, yeah. Uh, can we try first, play I think... Yeah, I wanted to suggest G4 here, but E5 oh. also is quite committing. Uh, move with then you want to play bishop e4 and so on mm -hmm. so it's got to be a very logical idea right e5 bishop e4 now black probably wants to play something like 97 95 bishop c6 this might cost a pawn so if i play rook b8 bishop e4 ah wait there's 95 is there there's 95 so that's why this king okay. is not where it's supposed to be yeah, so I suggest King E2 as our first candidate move in that okay, case. Okay, okay, Let, let's, let's do it, let's do it. Let's, let's play King E2 immediately so that uh, we can follow up with the idea to play E5. Let's say Black plays the same Rook B8, I guess. It's slightly passive though. I mean, I, I could play Rook D7 and Rook D8. Rook D7, Rook D8, try to apply some pressure here. Then I play... Yeah, you also want to bring another Rook on D8, right? Rook A to D8. Or I could start with your idea, Kelly, as you said. G4, Rook D8, and E5. Can I do this? Uh, no. I is it something. like Knight E5 still? Oh my goodness, I'm missing things. Okay, I'm going to start immediately E5. Okay. Um... Here, right? Bishop E4. And Knight E5. And I take it. And you take it. And now the king yep. on e2 yep. is not where it's supposed to be. Oh my goodness, Katy, where am I supposed to position this guy here? Just a sec, let me try to figure out. Okay, let me try e1. <laughs> king e1. But, but, but there's no e5 because after knight e5, the bishop on d3 is under attack. Help? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait. Yeah. Where, where, where did the position go? Yeah, sorry, sorry. My bad, my bad. Okay. So what's the follow-up here? I don't, I don't get it. Black wants um, to play rook d7, rook d8, right? I think this should be the most obvious choice for black. Apply pressure. Protect the pawn. Right. What am I supposed to do? Okay, let's try g4, rook d7, g5. I gain some space, I guess. h5. Then I play king e2, rook d8. Then what? Seems like to Maybe... me that white can hold the pawn on d4, to be honest. Yeah, but I'm going to take the pawn on b7 in return. I, I'm just going to knock on the table and say it's your turn. <laughs> I mean, what else, right? I, I see no active move here. Some sort of a whatever, I don't know. <laughs> uh, a3. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, I have to make a move. And the, the, no, the big point is after mass trades, maybe this is a position where. Yeah, you yeah, but play. it's quite equal, is it? Ooh, what's that? Nothing. Is it something? I'm not sure why this is even something. Rook e8 and bishop to b5? What? What? Bishop. Oh, wow, bishop <laughs> b5. Very nice. Bishop b5 cannot be taken. The medics on b5 cannot. Oh my goodness. Very sharp. You're very sharp, Kitty. 
Yeah, I've trained, I'm training today <laughs> with Grandmaster, so. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm failing to find a very deep idea here. Just a second. So everything is sort of perfect for white, but what to do next? Um, How do we carry yeah, the five? The, the, the problem is that in, in most of our lines, we cannot really hold the pawn on d4, right? So how about we just give up this pawn and come up with some kind of like endgame ideas? Maybe there we can have a little bit of something because bishop on e8 is still not the greatest piece. So how about we go something like king e2 anyways? Here. And I was thinking of bishop c2, bishop a4 ideas if we can make it on time. I don't know. So let's say uh, bishop c2. I'm going to play rook d8. You're going to play bishop a4. And I'm going to play whatever rook e7. I don't think you want to take, right? Do you? Uh, no, that's, that's not my plan indeed. But now at least now the pawn d4 is not hanging, right? So maybe you can just pass the move g3 or something like that. This is some kind of a mutual stalemate. I don't know. I mean, I don't see any progress for white. And maybe there's no progress for black. So they could maneuver a bit. I mean, if you're talking about these maneuvers, maybe uh, white can make some quiet moves like king e2, g3, a3, which I don't really understand what they contribute to the position. Okay, maybe g3 I understand, right? It protects the pawn mm -hmm. on, on h4, you know, some scenarios so that it's not under attack. But on the big scale of things, I, I just don't get it. So... The only idea I can think of is this e5 or d5. There you go. I mean, d5, either establish a pass pawn or play e5 and establish some weaknesses for your knight at some point later with something like 94, 95, with combining together with a pawn push at, uh, at a king side. But how to properly execute it? That's the big question. And that's why, yeah. of course, Slating G is thinking here. Yes, uh, we have a very interesting question in the chat. Uh, Bishop e8 is actually only move according to Stockfish. It's a question. Um, actually, this kind of uh, ideas of monitoring is happening quite often, right? So, Arthur, when you have this bishop on c8, you cannot develop your queen side, and you have this rook to bishop to d7, bishop to e, uh, e8. Uh, moves just waiting for a bit allow your rook to have some space some moves on c8 and as we mentioned earlier sometimes it's worth it to give up the pawn on b7 and instead bring all the pieces in the uh in the game and have nice counterplay uh rather than to wait for your opponent to get better and better position so this is not stockfish idea this is one of the uh one of the main ideas when you want to somehow get rid of the worst position right can i have another yeah. idea what if i uh force black to take on d4 i play king e2 you play mm -hmm. rook d7 i play rook c5 i'm not sure okay. what it really forces but let's say so you, you want to play d5 right In that yeah position. i I want to play d5, take with the rook, invite you to take it so that I can take on b7. And because of my bishops and slightly more center king, you know, maybe I have very, <laughs> very small edge in the endgame. I mean, I don't really know. So, for example, let's say take it, take it, take it, take many times. Um, I'm not even claiming this is forced under b7. Is, is this a thing? But there could be even bishop b5. Actually, I was thinking very similar to this, but to trade also extra rook uh, pair, so black will have back rank problem. Um, but yeah, this seems to me a bit too drawish. Yeah, this is drawish. Yeah, this is drawish. <laughs> what you showed, it's 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 a it's a checkmate for black. <laughs> I, I'm just trying to find some excitement here, which I don't see. But let me continue my thought. Maybe let's say black continues. Um, black doesn't take it, and black plays rook d8, and then I want to play d5. That was right. my silly idea. With the idea that after take it, I take with the rook, and after these mass trades, takes, takes, rook d5, rook b7, I do believe this should be sort of better for white. 
that's mm -hmm. a, that's a target these are active bishops your king's a bit far away should it be on c8 maybe it's about equalish but it's on g8 away from the queen side but i already discovered where's the problem with my plan black can play even something like 97 and maybe this pawn on d5 now actually becomes a liability so right. so, so there's that and I, again i'm back to square one and try and figure out what i'm supposed to do next so this yeah, is yeah so according moment. all of these arthur so we have to play king to e2 this this seems to be the logical move in this line uh and then after rook to seven i'm still thinking to bring this bishop somewhere uh and we have b1 or c2 square so i think c2 with this idea rook a4 and just to just to after rook to d8 now to make another nice move and just invite black to take on d4 how you're gonna g3 do that here you're g3. gonna you're gonna invite me to take with g3 but i think yeah. i might just accept it actually you know uh first i am not uh, i don't even have to do it but for the sake of the argument i'm gonna do it okay take 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 yum 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 many times many times many times rook b7 and let's say even something like bishop b5 right king e3 and whatever ah a4 is a positional threat so rook c4 is this a playable mm -hmm. position So bishop to b3, and if you give me a check, I'll play king to f4, as you have already demonstrated this road for the king. It's so equalish. I mean, unless somehow you're going to get the king on f6, which... Uh, ah, wait, there's king g7, bishop b6 problems. But you know, I don't believe it really. Maybe you in rook c5, just stop the king right here. And a4 yeah. is not a big deal. Bishop c4, bishop d. No, this is drawish. Maybe white is making an expression, a facial expression. He is doing something here, but yeah, I don't believe it. So maybe it's just equal. I see the bar is slightly giving some advantage to white, but uh, one thing, their viewers, is that uh, obviously the players don't know it. And yeah, that's true, actually. They have, and also another other thing is that uh, engine bar sometimes uh, gives the advantage, but uh, in a real game, it's not too much. Yeah, like plus 0 0.20 something, it's not much to convert it to win. If, so. the, if that would be something, then uh, some of the openings would be unplayable, like the King's Indian, like the Dutch defense. People just wouldn't play it because the engines immediately give a large advantage to white and uh, <laughs> you couldn't play. True. So it's all about can you find those moves? And there's one thing, Kerry, which engines don't understand. It's how easy it's to play. Unfortunately, nobody has hmm. taught engines this. I mean, there is no parameter for this as far as I know. How easy it's to find the moves for a human being. For engines, it's whatever. <laughs> But for a human being, I think for black, it's a lot easier to find most rook d7, rook d8 than for white try to come up with a very deep concept, which I still don't see. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I think we are missing Anna from the board. It's only Lei who is deep in the thoughts and she is spending almost 20 minutes. So earlier it was Anna and two moves ago and now it's Lei who is spending more time so this game is so complex like we're showing these lines but we're showing I think the only moves from both sides to keep it keep it equal otherwise if you make any other move if you risk too much you can end up risking way way too uh too uh in the match and for this reason they are taking the time and it's not something like we do right you can take back the moves and they cannot so 20 minutes exactly for this move lay is still thinking i really expect to see the move rather fast now at this point okay let me play out the engine line what the engine is saying i'm i'm going to try to play out the engine line so engine says the best move here is g3 <laughs> uh okay okay i mean i understand the move so rook d7, black continues the idea. Now engine says e5 is the move. I play okay. rook d8. Okay, I mean, all of this is logical. Now you see the bar, the bar is no zero. <laughs> so it doesn't mean anything. And now engine says bishop e4 is the best move. So allowing knight e5, which is a very easy way for black to discard, uh, for white to discard, because this is a point you don't want to miss. And then there's some sort of... Uh, 
King C3. King C3? <laughs> Whatever. I mean, I don't get it. Okay, let me wow. let me continue. Uh, bishop whatever d7 c7 i don't know so this is sort of equalish i mean it's difficult this is difficult and, and you see this position from afar and you still have to properly evaluate it and it's equal so that that's the best that engine come come up here so no wonder no wonder that letting g is thinking here there's nothing so mozachuk has come up with a very good setup for black yep and obviously she knew she knew how to how to uh equalize the position so once again i was i want to ask the question do you think that who do you think is more happy to go to the tie break in the uh rapid portion of the match mm. is it anna or is, is it lay no uh, it's got has to be anna uh, I think uh, Anna should be the favorite, I mean, at least on the paper, because like you said, I didn't really check it, but she's a couple of times world champ and rapid and blitz. Mm -hmm. So this should be quite important. Um, so that being said, I think she's feeling pretty confident in the tiebreak. She has already won one tiebreak, showing us a great preparation and great teamwork actually she was just she had they had both 10 minutes between the breaks and she was getting a consultation from the coaches as i learned from uh from the arbiters they both were getting consultation from the coaches and the coaches had phones with them and they were showing the lines and telling the lines uh, or the opening and then it seems that uh, Anna made so many surprises so many every game was something updated and uh, Connery was playing the same position in some of the games because she had better position and I was having some worse situations and then in the second part of the tie breaks then Anna took over uh, because of that well uh, prepared openings uh in fact maybe uh, many of our viewers don't know that lighting g is also quite strong in uh, rapid uh, no, chess as she has won silver medal uh at the world, uh, world rapid chess championship in Riyadh. i believe that was in 2019 um around yeah that year uh and i also remember her playing very good and probably won the medal as well in moscow world rapid and bleeds one of those tournaments so she is the player who has been uh, always in the top boards but anna is the one who has won three competitions right. so she's considered to be um favorite indeed yeah there's a confirmation in the chat one of the viewers says thank you in Riyadh 2017 and moscow 2019 17. so this okay yeah this this proves that indeed also letting g is a very very strong and rapid and the fact that anna has won several titles in rapid and blitz still doesn't mean anything mm -hmm. because this is the particular day uh when they're playing against each other and a lot of it's going to depend on the mood, how they feel, etc. I mean, there's so many factors which um, influence the way we play. So I, I still yeah. think we are going to see a lot of action in the classical uh, portion. So at yeah, least the games don't right. disappoint. No, not at all. Not at all. I was thinking the days will, would be longer and by meaning longer, like more like equal Petrov games but no it's it's more fun uh and why I, why i remember actually arthur why i remember lay from this event because she was very young and someone new at the time for for the moment she's 25 years old right so back then she was way young and she was playing among kostiny uh, lachno uh, Muzichuk and so on, so and other other Chinese players too, and she was someone new who was winning a lot of tournaments, and um, I surely remember her how much she was fighting to each each uh, games, and I have to admit that I was commentator in one of the events, and I was like really supporting her in my in the deep of my heart. I wanted to see her uh, winning something out of that competition. All right. 
Well, how long is she, is she thinking there? This has been something like 25, 25 minutes. Five minutes. Wow, that's a deep think. And once again, like for Anna, uh, when she was choosing for this H6 move a couple of moves ago, now this is once again one of those critical moments. You have to make a very big decision. And once again, it's not only about a single move, it's about the entire concept. I mean, how do you continue? Mm -hmm. So you have to calculate like a tree of uh, variations like rook c5 d5 idea you have to calculate if black takes if black doesn't take if black retreats have to compare give evaluation etc move on uh this is a very very a tough job and on top of that maybe in the end you don't really like any line i mean you just look at it and just look at it and look at it and you go over and over and over yeah. And that's why some some players start to get confused because there's nothing that you like, although the position is pretty normal. Yeah, position is pretty no normal. You have center. Um, your king is safe in the in the in the center as well. Uh, both rooks are very active, and it's black who has to worry about its own bad looking pieces. White has more space, which means the pieces are more happy. Uh, but still, we have seen so many moves here, so many variations, and in none of these variations, Black was struggling. No, not even a bit. I also think uh, that, Kerry, that in this match, we are going to see the same pace in the classical portion, that they're going to play out very fast, the opening phase. I mean, yesterday it was pretty fast, but today it was just lightning, right? I mean, very, very fast first uh, 15 moves or so. And then it significantly slows down, right? I mean, something like 10 to 15 moves, uh, 10, 15 minutes per move. And finally, as I said it, E5 is played. I guess you have to play this move at some point. Yeah, and uh, engine for the moment dropped down and gives Black slightly better position. Uh, maybe it's because Black is getting a pawn on E5, right? After Rook D7, if Anna goes to that line, then rook to d8 you cannot really really afford this pin on d file yeah but now rook d7 does it even is it even necessary because i understand the entire idea carry of rook d7 and rook d8 was to target the spawn on d4 i mean mm -hmm. it is still a possibility uh to try to be 95 and rook takes on d3 but i'm pretty sure that white is gonna notice that or something like king you one bishop be one very quickly so how about this idea to get the bishop on c6. Okay, knight to... Somehow. <laughs> now, if I is rook c5, I guess. And then you go back. Okay, so maybe not this. And if I play knight e7, white simply going to snatch the ball. Okay, what about rook b8? With the idea, knight e7, bishop c6, what do you do? Yeah, that's that's good looking move, rook to b8. And now the question is how you're stuck. Maybe bishop to e4, and that's when you're capturing the pawn on e5. Right, then I capture it. I guess, I guess I have to take it. Takes, takes, and some sort of uh, rook b7. Mm -hmm. The bar hits it. We're going somewhere in the wrong direction with uh, white here. I think instead of taking on b7, there was bishop b5 idea. And if I take and take uh, with the bishop here, oh, or with a, I think black is slightly better, right? This, this pawn is a weakness. Mm -hmm. There's some bishop a seven threats, e five threats, while white has created himself some problems. Yeah, this is definitely looking good for black. Mm -hmm. So what was it once again? E five, rook b eight. With the idea to play knight bishop e four, bishop e. Okay, maybe not bishop e four. Maybe bishop e4 is not a good move. And if I play something like, <laughs> yeah, where do you place the king? King e2. King e2, I play knight e7, you play, oh, there's bishop b5 idea already here. Now, actually, I think white needs to be really careful here. Because, for example, if you get the bishop b5, knight e5, then this pawn gets effectively blocked. For example, just some random move, let's say, rook c2. Rook c2, bishop c6, whatever. 
Rook goes back at ninety five. I mean, this should be already a great position for for Black, right? Because the center has been blocked. Uh, Black enjoys a very good blockade. The bishop can join the game with simple like bishop of eight and take control of many critical squares. And at some point, you start march for the pawns. Yeah, if I, if I was quite committing move, Very and committing. Uh, if you give up the control over d5, the things can get so ugly for white. So, so, so ugly. If knight gets on d5, bishop gets on c6 or b5, then the dark square bishop can also get f8 and the other side of the board, rook c8 and so on and so on. So what Lei has in her mind, that's that I'm so curious about. Maybe at some point she wants to play a4 to control b5 square. So bishop will not come on b5. Here we go again. Uh, let's say. You mean here? Yeah. a4. I, I mean, after bishop e4. Bishop e4 first. You take on e5. Take stakes. And maybe here a4, just to wait. OK. Uh, that's really deep. So you're saying the pawn is not going to go anywhere? Yeah, I'm I'm obviously taking one of the pawns. Pawn on b7, pawn on h6, bishop on e5. There's too many things happening, yeah? You have to guard all of this. Maybe. And if I go back, bishop g7? Um, Just to take the pawn, yeah. Bishop takes. The spawn is under attack. I'm, I was trying to rely somehow on a, a, e5, but you can always play b5. Now this indeed becomes a monster. And a5 now is yeah. a prime suspect. Um, and I was actually thinking here, either king to d3 or king to king d3, king e4, king c3 to guard the pawn on d4 and then free my bishop or rook to start to attack. Maybe bishop f4 or bishop c7. This is definitely interesting. Yeah, hmm. I, th I think so. Th this looks pretty good. So once again, rook b8, bishop e4. What was it? Knight e5, knight e5, bishop e5, and a4. Look at that. That's that's a very deep concept. I mean, it makes sense. This must be the idea where white is uh, trying to steer the game. Should be yeah, about equal because, yeah. Because otherwise, e five is the move that you you are losing the pawn very soon on e five if you move your bishop or you are getting like giving up d five square. I, I don't know which one is the worst for white here to give up d five square or to lose that pawn. So she was spending some time, and maybe that's what she was actually calculating all this time. And there's also, Kelly, there's also the possibility that black is not going to take on e5. I mm -hmm. don't find it very likely to be possible, but let's say something like knight a5 or knight e, okay, knight a5, I guess is necessary to protect the pawn, attack the rook, and let's say I go... Rook c7, maybe? Rook c7, and I wanted to play bishop c6. All right. And, yeah. But still, it leads more or less the same position, right? Oh, Oh, I blundered a four. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I blundered a four. I, I thought knight c six. I thought knight c six, and then I wanted to use my yeah. rooks here to dominate the possession. Uh, maybe even just take on b seven right away. Take, 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 and somehow because of more centralized pieces, I, I wanted to claim advantage. I just blundered. Um, this must be the idea of uh, white. And now the big question is what uh, Anna Mozichuk is going to do. She has spent seven minutes already after that move, figuring out what's going on. Uh, and this is move 19. So they have to make 21 more moves to reach the time control. And I don't see time time problem, time issues come into this game either. No, no, not yet. But uh, definitely we can see the pace of the game has uh, considerably slowed down. So maybe Anna can still consider to play rook d7, but then again, it doesn't look very logical. But what do I know? I mean, let's say rook d7, uh, something like bishop e4, or maybe let's say king e2, rook d8, 
and something like bishop b4. So this line doesn't make any sense from Black's perspective because now the bishop on c6 is not easily going to make it. So I don't see um, Black doing this. Yeah, it's really unnecessary to do so, right? You can uh, you can guard the pawn on b7 in another way, rook to b8. This rook on a file does really nothing anyway, so you can move. But also, like most like this rook to a, rook to b8 is sometimes uh, harder to come up with, right? It's just it's a bit passive move, right? It's it's quite yeah. passive move. It's a passive move, and maybe that's why it just you don't want this move to make, but. Apparently here it might be the best choice, along of the all of the other. By the way, I mean Rook B7 is still not a threat. <laughs> Nothing really has changed. So maybe there's some other moves as well. Don't ask me which ones. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. So dear viewers, how are you feeling about this game? How do you feel <laughs> it's going to finish? I mean, it's a bit slow, right today? Uh, so there's a very massive um, strategic battle. Uh, feels about equalish. The bar slightly doesn't like White's choice e5, and says uh, White should have went for whatever g3. But I kind of don't understand what's the idea. Uh, yeah, it started quickly, and now now we're waiting for the next moves. Not much is happening here. So, in case you just joined us, you're watching the second game of the semi-final match of the FIDE Women Candidates Tournament. There's a, a lot of prize money at stake. So, overall, 20, uh, I'm sorry, 250,000 prize fund for uh, all the participants, eight participants in total. And the winner is going to qualify for the match, World Championship match against the reigning champion, Yuvin Yum from China. Right, and uh, this is the pool A. Yeah. The players have been divided two pools: pool A, pool B. This is the semi-final or the final, however you call it, of pool A. And the pool B is going to be held later in Uzbekistan, 28th November until 11th December. Yes, and out of this, the winner is gonna get 16,000 euros each participant, just because they have qualified to here got 20,000 euros, which is quite nice price and Arthur the winner also gonna get quite some time quite, quite some uh money in the world championship match because usually that is the highest uh budget that the most of the tournaments have so uh you're getting something from here and then in the potentially you're getting even more so big 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 uh stake on the on the table right now and our chat is like this is draw this is low risk game it is and you guys to be honest i wish to play <laughs> this this kind of drawish games in my games because mostly after i played a tournament recently i was having so bad positions from the very beginning from like move 10 or 15 i was then getting into a huge problem and i was spending all my time and energy to recover it so it's not bad actually to play stubborn lines like more like uh secure lines and to go for a draw so-called draw or equal positions because um that's the way you're gonna lose the least of your games right so you're gonna play solids openings uh and then sometimes you're gonna have this opportunities when your opponent plays some mistake and that's when you are going to take advantage of so myself i'm really trying to learn from these lines and you guys can also just learn from it and learn how to play for instance in a greenfield against greenfield or how to play with black this line and meanwhile we got the move rook to d5 i did not expect it this was coming honestly it's a great move kenny uh, i like it yeah. Uh, check this out. It deals directly with bishop e4. For example, uh, bishop e4, I think black is going to play rook b5. So this rook on b6 is checkmate. Checkmate. That's it. You have to take, I guess, right? 
Rook b5, Ed x on b5, and now suddenly the black rook is in the game. Of course, combining with the same previous ideas, 94, 95, bishop c6. So I don't think that white is going to play bishop e4 now. And the second idea of rook b5, I think it's to play knight a5. If rook b5 is not going to work, maybe knight a5. Now the rook on d5 is protecting the knight on a5 so that black can play bishop c6 or bishop b5 later on. It's a very logical move. Yeah, and I was surprised that we did not even consider this move, right? Rook to d5. Why, now that I see it, play? makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and just, of course, as usual, say it's slightly worse, uh, mm -hmm. which I'm not going to argue. I'm, I'm not really sure why it should be slightly worse, but uh, uh, the concept, I like it. So I think also for uh, Anna, so uh, uh, Rook B8, I think was, according at least to the engines, was the strongest move and Rook D5 is slightly worse. But if you see something like Rook D5, it's a very logical move. It's It makes sense. It comes together with ideas like Rook B5, Knight A5, Bishop B5, Bishop C6. And once you see this, you're simply not looking at anything else. Yep, and after rook d5, what I can see now, engine suggests to move this rook from c4 square, so then you're going to control b5 square with the bishop, and there will be no uh, checkmate for b6 uh, rook. Um, but it's funny that after this move, now black can play rook to b8, guard the pawn on b7, and we remember that this knight can go on e7 or a5. And the moment you bring this bishop on c6, the things will be just well guarded. And then you can bring this rook somewhere else, get the knight on d5, and position will turn uh, turn the directions. I think, Eddie, this game can explode at any given moment. It's a bit slow. The pace has slowed down, but it can uh, make an unexpected turn very quickly. So the players are, you know, maneuvering here quietly, trying to carry out their plans. And actually, Rook C3 is not really such an engine move, Kelly, because it also is attacking the pawn on B7 and is dealing with the threat of an A5, mm -hmm. right? So, for example, let's say Rook B8 probably is a move, but maybe Yana doesn't really want to make a passive-looking move. And I'm thinking you could try to sacrifice a pawn, something like Rook A5, a3 and 97 again going for a fork 95 and 96 and after rook b7 try to go for super activity think about bishop b5 bishop f8 and now this pawn on a3 is also a prime target yeah that's that's the that's the way how we can finally activate all the pieces and get something out of it and uh what has this extra pawn on the in the center but the pawn is so uh, guarded and at some point white maybe even hopes not to have this pawn on the board so the knight will have d4 square and the bishop will be more open to uh look on the queen side too um yeah that's that sounds sounds like a plan and rook d5 is kind of like fighting move it's not something that i i'm happy with a draw i want to take the pawn but i'm I want to fight. I want to open up the A file right now, play rook to b5 and trade these rooks. And uh, if you are against that, if you if you say no and you play something like rook c3 or rook c2, then she's going to keep her plan, which was to regroup the pieces, get this bishop from e8 finally into the game, and c6 or b5 seems to be the square the bishop would like to go. Right, right. Okay, now what can we do from the wise perspective? So obviously we see the idea of rook b5, rook a5, we see the idea of knight a5, bishop c6, or maybe knight e7, bishop c6, you name it. So mm -hmm. what do we do? Can we play something ridiculous like rook c5? Is this an idea? So the idea uh, is in not... this case. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We dropped the pawn on e5, right? Can I take and take on e5? I I want to trade, and maybe there's maybe not even rook b7, but like bishop e4. Now this looks better for white. I have very beautiful bishops. There's bishop e7, c6, c7 ideas. The pawn on h6, by the way, is under attack. Okay, bar as usual says this is nothing, but I I, I think this is rather interesting, and maybe black is not going to take on e5 and play rook b8 first, mm -hmm. but then. I managed to play bishop e4, 
And again, I don't think you really want to take on e5, or do you? I mean, can take, of course. Maybe knight e4 is the next move at some point. Let's say king e2, knight e4. Try to get to the pawn. Okay, let's try this. Take, take, take. And here. Take, take. Uh, yeah. With this c pawn, this can get really scary, yeah, because the uh, white king is also closer to the pawn. And mm -hmm. how exactly black is going to stop the pawn? That's a very good question, and that's why I like rook c5. It's a very logical idea. I mean, probably for letting g, she shouldn't have expected rook d5, and she has played something else. Yeah, she played uh, uh, rook c2. Yeah, but I think rook c5 made a lot of sense. But it would change the character of the game so much. I guess she wasn't really in tips, uh, ready to do this. So rook c2. Uh, the idea is to not allow rook b5 because the bishop on d3 protects it. The pawn on b7 is also under attack. The pawn on a2 now is just in case protected. So here I believe Muzichuk has to make a big choice. Maybe... Oh wait, rook a5 doesn't work anymore. I just take the pawn. You have no time for knight e7. I just take it. There's no knight e7, right? Uh, there is. There's no knight e7. I mean, knight e7, I just take it. Yeah, maybe bishop f8 now with ideas bishop before, knight before. Mm, and if I play something like rook b2? And you play, let's say, knight e7, there might be some, yeah, issues with rook b8. Yeah, look at this pieces on the king sides they are not oh, oh i saw actually they this is a check oh my goodness i'm i'm so bad <laughs> i can listen it okay this is not a check obviously and yeah <laughs> this is a cluster cluster of pieces doing nothing there so maybe not like this so what do you play rook b8 and i could play rook b2 uh right can we now do something like uh, uh, take on e5, take on e5, and then to play bishop to b5? To take c5 and bishop b5. Am I missing something? I just take it, no? Yes, and yeah, that's. That's unexpected. I was expecting rook b3 and <laughs> ah. then rook d8. Ah, but... you, were, you, you wanted to capture this bishop here. I understand yeah. it, but I think rook b5 is very strong. Yeah, take it. That's very strong with these two bishops in the end game against rook. No, thank you very much. That's not right. That's not very nice position for black. Okay, maybe not 95 right away. It doesn't mean this idea is not there. But I think this is this is White's idea. She played rook c2 with the idea to play rook b2 next. So most likely rook b8, I guess. Rook goes here. And maybe there's some, again, some active way to sacrifice the spawn. I don't think black is ever going to play something like knight e8. Knight a5 is a possibility, but this knight on the edge of the board is... What did we use the word? A mourner, yeah? <laughs> uh, not doing yeah. anything. So... I don't think I don't think uh, black is gonna do it. Wait, oh, there's not. Oh, actually, bishop takes a six is uh, is another threat here. Oh, can we do that? Oh, I missed. There's a bishop on e8 under attack. Okay, I cannot do that. I'm missing so many things actually. So bishop a six. You just take the pawn. I could whatever sacrifice it for some super activity and play something like this but i mean still it's a pawn right it's a healthy pawn and the knight on a5 is not doing much so why did we put it there <laughs> i mean it's got to be on d5 not on a5 now, yeah this rook actually changed so so much of the uh, Black's plan, right? After rook d5, now it's going to take more time to get this rook somewhere else and play knight d7, knight d5. Are there moves like f6 still valid in this position? Mm, probably, yeah, at some point. Take, take. 
some pressure here, although you're giving up the pawn on h6. Okay, yeah, Mark hates it, but it doesn't mean f6 is not a move. I mean, at some point, f6 could be a move to include the bishop in the game. I'm more inclined, Kerry, that black might want to sacrifice the pawn on b7. I just don't know how. Maybe just rook a5. Oh, we actually have a very nice idea in the chat from GM Solver, who is himself grandmaster and quite well-known grandmaster. He suggests rook to a d8. And after rook takes b7, then to take on e5. All of this looks the same, really. But this makes sense, yeah. Take, take. And then you take on d4. Although this position even can be... Ah, wait, I have no good way to escape into my king. I thought that even this position can be playable. With your weakness on h6, with the active rooks on the 7th rank, despite the fact it's Oplacar bishop. But I, mm -hmm. I saw bishop b5, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do against it. Because king of 3... Ah, wait, there's no bishop c6. Okay, I can play king of 3. Even this is a, a playable position. Probably a drawish, though. Yeah, probably... Probably drawish, yeah. Yeah. All right. And uh, this is move 20. The players have reached about 45 minutes each, yeah. the so-called equator of the first time control. There could be there could be time scramble. What do you think, Eddie? Is it going to make it to the time scramble? No, I don't believe so. No? Like, I think, like, if we call it, like, 10 minutes for... For four or five moves, I don't think this. No, 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 no. I think seconds on the clock for last a few moves, last uh, seven, five moves is the time scramble. Right. We like to see. <laughs> okay, what else is here? I mean, let's try to picture ourselves in black shoes. So you want to get out the bishop on e8, and if the pawn on b7 has to go, whatever. So be it. So be it. Um, what else? So rook b2 is the obvious idea. Can I play? No, I can't. <laughs> now I was thinking something like 97, 95. Just so like, yeah, the white can. Like this. I don't uh, like it. I don't like it myself. G4? Yeah, it's just G4. G4, and you are kind of forced to take the, oh, okay. the it's bad. bishop. And with the center, oh, that's so good position for white, yeah. Okay, okay. Not a very good plan. What else? How do I else to get a bishop out? I was thinking of knight to... Knight to actually animate the move, I believe. Rook to d8 has been played, yeah. Rook, to Rook 8 is on the board. So Anna is saying 95. It's a big threat. What are you gonna what are you gonna do against it? And it makes perfect sense, by the way. The rook on a8 hasn't been yet developed. Now it is. 95 is a very big idea. So I guess and we'll... what happens after bishop to c4 or bishop was... to e4? Bishop to e4, for instance. All right. Like if you play now rook to b5, then I can just take that and attack this pawn with rook to b2 and try to win it. And I could play something like b4, try to sell you the pawn. For example, if you take it, <laughs> bishop c6, rook d4, I have very active bishops. And these pieces are not really the best. So the bishop on e3 is a bit passive, looking at his own pawns. The knight is, well, let's just put it this way. It has seen better days. So rook a8, bishop d5, and black has excellent chances to take over. Maybe something like this. So what was it? Uh, bishop e4, rook b5. Mm -hmm. uh, rook b2, right? Rook b2, you just lose the pawn on e5 once again. Rook b2, let's say I take it, take it to 95. All over the same idea. 
Uh, Which again is somehow takes. borderline equalish. So take, take. And you say on b7 or king c3 first? Maybe king yeah. c3. Yeah, maybe king c3, push away the bishop, but I don't see how white is better here. Maybe, maybe white is. So there's a there's a very good chance, Kelly, that uh, the game might be heading to something like this, some sort of an isolated queen spawn structure, the pawn on d4, where white king is slightly more active. Essentially, well, white has an extra king, right? Because this king on g8 <laughs> is not really playing, while this king right. can at some point do something. Yeah, when there are like less and less pieces on the board, uh, it will be less danger for this white. Like for instance, for for now there are still some checks for the king like bishop f8 check and so on it's just very unpleasant but if one more piece is off the board for instance i th i think the greatest chance for white is to go to the light square bishop end game um or any bishop end game could be just great for white yeah because huh, you have a very makes, yeah it, that actually makes me feel like maybe we should look more for traits for white you just to get that... into any kind of one piece end game, one piece and this extra king that white has. I think white is going to enjoy pretty much any end game uh, where he gets to trade these pawns, and assuming there's not enough pressure on the pawn on d4 because the white king is very active. But I mean, this is such a heavy game, right, Kerry? I mean, all of the lines we're looking at look very similar. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, that's why I also think it's very easy to get confused also by the players. Like this e5 idea, I think also for latent g, she's pretty sure this is the classical idea, but, but at which moment to execute it? Also for Anna, she knows the typical idea is to play 97 bishop c6 or whatever, but at which moment to execute it? And every single move is like a, a giant struggle. They're struggling it out. And uh, while they are while they're struggling, and while we are struggling to understand them, I think we are going to take another break really here, Kelly. What, what do you think? <laughs> I think it's the time to end this struggle and also come back with maybe more moose. So guys, don't go anywhere. Off you go during the break and come back and check out what's happening in the second game of the Women's Kind Day Tournament because this game can be decisive and you don't want to miss it out. We'll be back soon in a few minutes. Now you can use gifts from the biggest chess stars on all your favorite platforms. Just search chess.com and your favorite chess star on Discord, Twitter, WhatsApp, and more to find hundreds of gifts from chess.com's biggest broadcast and events. Nepo, Danya, Bobby, Anna's, and even me, Danny. Try it today.
Welcome back, everyone. This is 2022 for the Women's Candidates Tournament for a semi-final. And here we have last two participants into the match. Leighton G, you can see on the screen. And then we saw also Anna Muzicic just got into our camera view. This is um, the championship which is happening in Monaco, which is considered to be a great place for women in chess as a lot of tournaments has held here at this place and usually ladies do like to come here and play the uh, chess tournaments as the conditions is great here after uh for now uh here this is the playing venue in hotel hermitage uh which also hosted another great chess person can you give a wild guess who it might be it was many years ago that one of well-known grandmaster in the chess figure stayed at this tournament for uh, can i guess it hotel for chess tournament yeah it just just give a wild guess uh bobby fisher yes are you said to me <laughs> yesterday you don't remember that you said to me yesterday so so <laughs> that's bobby fisher i would have never guessed really yeah i was like uh, did i just tell you or not so people will not think that we had this conversation earlier but we surely had a conversation earlier because yeah probably we did um, some off topic off yeah. the stream yeah yeah or be for this stream yeah that's right so the place has seen a lot of chess players indeed and it's very interesting because every day we have new new people coming here in the playing venue and, and they are making first moves and those are the people who are sponsoring a lot of events here uh in monaco and that is indeed something that we're missing so much Arthur, we're missing so much in uh, in women's uh, chess that there's not enough tournaments. There, there's not enough budget for the tournaments like this. And to have sponsors like in Monaco, it's I wish we have all of them in many different countries too. Um, but it's quite, quite tough uh, competition, right? Four games a match. Usually we do have like standard matches, two games only. And if it's a draw, then we have tie breaks right away. So this is a bit longer tournament for the participants. Right. Yeah, it's a, indeed a very tough tournament. And you can see that's why these games are so tense. They're not fast paced. Mm -hmm. They're in the classical games. And uh, uh, yeah, compared to some um, actually the time control games here, the quality of the most is higher. But uh, mm -hmm. I do believe that we are going to get our fair share of action here today. I mean, now there's this maneuvering, etc. They're trying to find out some weaknesses, a lot of brainstorming of uh, strategical ideas, uh, tactical ideas like 95, etc. So it doesn't seem maybe much, but uh, the game is incredibly, incredibly tense at the moment. So game two of the semifinal match of the Women Candidates Tournament and both players are desperately looking towards the fight to win the game, to win the mini match and qualify for the match for the mm -hmm. World Championship title against the reigning champion Juven Juven. The stakes are the highest and playing in Monaco, uh, it definitely, it's got to be feeling great. It definitely does. Uh, and in fact, tomorrow the players going to have a day off. So here we have like two rounds, then day off and then another two rounds uh but guess what they will not spend the time uh, i wanted to ask you going that, outside <laughs> i wanted to ask you yes. that getty because you've been there for quite some time so what are they doing in the rest of it? so you did mention for example that lighting g is trying to avoid the contact due to the uh, health issues mm -hmm. concerns uh, what about the other players do they have some kind of a culture program do they go for some sightseeing or they spend the time at a casino? I mean, what are, what are they doing there? Uh, well, to go to casino here is everyday thing. Uh, and obviously we go to casino to, uh, not to not to play some games, but to have uh, the dinner because uh, uh, 
as I mentioned yesterday, this uh, hotel is a part of the chain of other hotels and the casino as well. So we do have a card which gives us accessibility to many places as well as casino. Uh, and um, Anna and Maria Muzichuk said that they love to love the food at one of the hotels, one of the uh, restaurants at the casino. Um, so they mostly go there and also chess players do love to walk after the games. So I have seen them walking a lot outside, enjoying the walk. I also saw Konuru Hampi just going outside to see the city, beautiful city. You don't need to take your public transport. You just can just walk around. It's nice, tiny place. You can go everywhere. Um, and itself, the location is very close to the port, so you can also go to the seaside and to many shops. Uh, and also, Arthur, this you said that you have never been in Monaco. What I really uh, found very interesting here, uh, the whole uh, place is like pretty much the like hill, like you have to go up the hill and then go down. And in the middle of the street, they have uh, elevators or stairs. And you can instead of walking, you can just stand and the elevator will take you take you all the way up on the next uh, next uh, uh, str uh, next street. So that's something very interesting. So you I'm don't need sure. to walk physically. I mean, you're just carried if you want. I mean, you can walk, but if you are getting tired because it's really, really sharp hill, then you can just uh, take elevators. So this is something that something very unique for Monaco that you don't see it uh, very often. Also, uh, there was some preparation for for Mulavan, which happens here uh, in Monaco, and Monaco is known for for that. So there are a lot of lot of attraction, but as players are so focused. Uh, for the uh, for the competition for the tournament, they are once in a while using these uh, opportunities to go to spa or to go to pool, uh, but usually they are just spending most time of for preparation. That's right. That's pretty much it. Yeah, yeah, and I think tomorrow it will be also a lot of hours of preparation for these two players. It sounds like a fun place to be in. And then just as you finished explaining how great it is to be in Monaco, also Lei Ting Ji decided to make her move. Bishop E4 is played. And I think there's a very, very big likelihood we are going to see a couple of moves being played pretty fast. Um, meaning Rook B5 looks very logical to me. Yeah, no? this Rook is pretty much running out of the moves, right? Maybe Rook A5 uh, so... is also a move, of course, but uh, this looks pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. Unless there's some crazier ideas with some exchange sacrifice on D4, which I'm not sure I even want to investigate. Okay, let's let's not say we are so desperate. So what about, <laughs> what do we discuss? Rook B5? I guess we take it. Take it. And you were saying rook b2, I think, last time, right? Yeah, rook b2 to attack the pawn on b5. But then again, knight e5 is an issue. Let's say rook b2. I could take it, take it, take it. And this pawn is also under attack. Some king c3, bishop b7. But at best case, white is just equal. OK, maybe not like this. Maybe not like this. Just a second. So. We take it. What about we just mm -hmm. play yeah. some quiet move, King E2? Knight well, before. I think Knight to, yeah, Knight before Knight E7 to keep the plan going. Rook C7, you said. And after rook b2 here, uh, there is this move extra, uh, something like rook to f8. Like if you want to hold the knight on d on b4 and play bishop c6, maybe you can go for this. Yeah, I'll just take the pawn. But you know, I I get it. I really like this idea. Just knight e5, bishop c6, and mm -hmm. I think if black managed to play this and then bishop f8 at some point earlier, this is the one of the most. Uh, ideal blockades that Black is dreaming for, although this pawn now is doubled. So it's a bit unusual 
unusual pawn structure. I guess it's about equal. So that's why also the bar says it makes sense. But also there might be rook a5. With the idea to play. Right, rook a5 insist- is equally, equally, equally strong, I believe. Mm-hmm. But uh, Arthur, can we can we see some crazy line here? You mentioned earlier a sacrifice it. of I'm exchange. I'm also craziness. So I was just checking this. How about rook to d4? Yeah, this is what I said. Uh, I don't want to talk about. Okay, rook d4. <laughs> takes. Knight, knight takes. Knight takes. Bishop uh, takes. I'm not even. Yeah, I guess I have to take. Take, take. And yeah. king e3. And now instead of rook d4, black can actually take pawn on e5 with bishop. Uh, no, no, no. Instead of rook d4. Yeah, oh. Here, rook d4. And uh, plan to take this bishop. Next move. So, uh, and now just to take it. With the rook or the bishop? Take with the bishop. I think with bishop would be just better. King e1. Just to and, avoid some checks. Uh, just to avoid some checks, just in case. Yeah, and here black can play some of like king to g7. So the question is, how big is white's advantage here? I'm not sure that black is so desperate to go to this uh, line, but this can be also a possibility. Mm, definitely. Yeah, definitely. If there's nothing uh, better than black could go here, but uh, voluntarily, I mm-hmm. I doubt it. Maybe there was a, a similar line where you could remove these pawns, and this is like a part of the way to liquidate, right? You go into the same game, four pawns against three at the king side, and yeah, that's part of the way how you make a draw. Yeah, then maybe, but here it's a funny line. I mean, usually, Kelly, I suggest these uh, <laughs> lines when, when I'm not playing myself. It's like, uh, I see these ideas. <laughs> yeah, of but, course. <laughs> but I would I would probably never play it myself because it's fun, but not for yeah. me to play. As a commentator, we have this uh, uh, opportunity to show some some lines and also by showing these lines you can you, you can just argue how how you can just say that how safe the position is for black like even if you play the worst possible move here you can still fight for for equality so rook b5 happened right rook b5 i took right away uh, as there was no other a uh, choice and it takes b5 so now white has to make a choice to attack the pawn on b5 is there anything else that white can just play ignore this pawn on b5 because they are double anyway also and they the, are not going too far also the 95 threat is still there so you need to mm-hmm. deal with this and uh, maybe actually white could play something like try to hide the king on b1 so that the rook is free from the need to defend the pawn on a2 but now the big question Kerry, is what do you do against knight b4 knight d5 bishop c6 because once again we enter the position where engines simply don't understand the concept it's easier to play with black i mean you have these very typical ideas and and there's also on top of that the 95 mm-hmm. threat so what are you going to do about it rubito oh, that's a very good question actually i was uh I was thinking uh, about King C1, as you uh, suggested, Knight B4 and Rook to C7 to activate the Rook on the seventh rank. If you take the pawn on A2, then King B2. And so far, I'm happy with my King here, controls everything. And I will pick up the B7 pawn. Yeah, with what? Uh, probably, yeah, with the Rook. So if you play and, and this, this costs you a pawn, yeah? You're, you're not yeah, at this point, I think knight b5, knight e5 is something that black can play. And I was thinking maybe, maybe we can now or later, uh, just to get this knight from f3 to d2, b3 and c5. That's the square I would like to have my knights. But what about this move, Kitty? I mean, what about bishop yeah. d5? You have problems here to recapture the rook because you have rook b8 mm-hmm. here and bishop d2. This could be an issue. There's oh, I love that. Yeah, th- there's some major issues. And after f6, at least you're losing a pawn. Let's say take it here and bishop h6. At least. I mean, on top of all the choices, this actually looks like something real for white. Just a second. So uh, what was it? A takes on b5, king c1. I like the idea to get the king on b2 or b1. Let's say black mm-hmm. tries to force matters. I mean, black doesn't have to do it. Rook c7 yeah. is a brilliant idea, Kelly. So... 
Okay, knight a2 maybe is not necessary. Maybe bishop c6? Uh, can we go knight to d2 right away here? Knight d2. So if you capture the bishop, I'll capture back with the knights. And my knight from f3 going to get on e4. It's a better square. Engine hates that. Must be because of knight e5. Oh. Checkmate. And the difference is that now when you take the knight on d5, bishop going to take it. And this bishop is a monster bishop on d5. Yeah. Wins a pawn, probably. That's a monster. That's a monster. So... I guess you still take it, and I take with a pawn, and you play something like a3, knight e5, rook c6, rook a8. There's nothing for white, is there? Despite the fact that white has an extra pawn, this looks more drawish than it's better for white. I mean, in fact, you're going to even keep yeah. the pawn alive. So how is this once again? Let me check it. Let's Let's go slowly. King e2. She goes right. the other way. She goes the other way. King e2. Ah, okay. So after king e2 and knight b4 now, Arthur, we can go rook c7 again. So this is a trap, I guess. Like if you take the pawn on a2, maybe I have bishop to d2. And your knight's for a moment is holding there. It's imprisoned. And if I play... If I play b4... I think rook takes b7. And... Um, how are you going to play? Like, there's also bishop to b1 at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Anna played bishop to f8. She didn't went for knight to b4. And she didn't even spend so much time to calculate all these lines, right? Just went right away. Uh, because you know what, this knight on c6 actually holds this c file, so white cannot make this rook c7 moves, and uh, this rook, bishop to f8 move makes me feel like Anna is the one who now it's Anna's turn to make decision. Like, if I'm not going to open up the position, if I'm not going to play knight before, you cannot go against it, you cannot do much about it and i taking so. over the game i think i think that's the feeling here because uh, she's trying to play a bit faster also get a look at the clock mm -hmm. uh, anna mozachuk has 37 minutes versus letting g's 24 minutes they have made 23 moves and the position is still easier for black to play you want to play most like 9 b4 you want to play bishop c6 9 e5 not necessarily in that order Rook eight is an easy move, and I love Bishop of eight because it doesn't reveal your cards. I mean, why give up yeah. the C file just like that? Bishop of eight mm -hmm. activates your bishop. There's a very nice long diagonal, and you have all of these ideas at your disposal. Rook a8, knight b4, knight e5, bishop c6, bishop e7, king h7, a lot of easy moves. I think here Mozuchuk could actually make a major result. Yeah, and uh, I, I agree with you. I agree uh, with you. This bishop f8 move is the move that you feel that you are. You have the power now. It's like once again, as yesterday. In the yesterday's game, engine was in the middle of the board all the time. But we were we were saying that that's most important is how the players are feeling. And with the body language, you could easily say that Lady G was happy with her position. But now look at this body, uh, a body image now. Lady G is someone who is so focused. It's a totally different person today, right? She's not moving too much. She's not that relaxed as yesterday. And uh, I can I can see satisfaction on Anna's face, and she is <laughs> so much enjoying this position. This is the position that she's very strong at. Anna like, is like, <laughs> yeah. This is how totally this is how I different. felt yesterday. This is how I felt yesterday. Now it's my time. So she definitely yeah. feels good. It absolutely. She is. We saw one of space yesterday. It, she was like so not enjoying it, and Anna is the person you can who can easily read. Like uh, she is not like afraid to show her emotions. Whatever happens, also in the in the life, she's if she's not happy, she 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 you can feel it. You can feel it for sure. Uh, she will not hide. So also it's visible on the chessboard. Look at her. She's so happy calculating many lines and she has no problems whatsoever and the time 
difference. I think Anna's, Anna's strategy here is to drop the time on late clock and then um, go uh, open up the position more and complicate the position more. I think Anna becomes here a favorite in this game. I obviously mm -hmm. see the bar. The bar says it's dead equal. But the one thing, their viewers, that you also have to take into account, we discussed this already uh, like a couple of times during today's broadcast, is that, again, the easiness to play. Because for white, I mean, what's your plan? So this knight here is stuck defending the pawn on d4. The bishop on a3 has the same fate. Bishop on e4 is beautiful. But it's staring at the knight on c6. You play rook b2, b4 is going to be pretty much automatic response, most likely from black. By the way, rook b2 is not even a threat because in some lines, rook b5, now there might be some discovered attack from the knight on c6 and the bishop on e8 as well. So the big question actually is what are you supposed to do for white? I mean, sit and wait until something happens. This is a bad strategy. You want to have some clear plan. I agree. I agree absolutely with that. Uh, so uh, what we usually do is we're finding the worst pieces, like most less active pieces on the board and trying to get it better. So in this case, bishop on e3 is not the greatest piece. They are in the knight on f3, but uh, unfortunately, too, why you can't really move those two pieces around because the d4 pawn is hanging, right? right? And you don't want to give up the bishop, light square bishop for the knight on c6. That's that's gonna be a very bad decision. Mm, so I'm thinking, Arthur, maybe maybe we can just uh, try to move this knight somewhere, knight e1 or knight e2, give up the d4 pawn, and instead get the b7 pawn. Yeah, but it's such a and I already see the h4 choice. pawn out there is hanging. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like 91, 94 takes, takes, bishop b7. Yeah, you just take the pawn. Catch for, yeah. Yeah, you just take the pawn. Okay, maybe there's some chances to go for uh, active counter play with rook e8 and use these bishops, which are kind of clumsy. Maybe, yeah, maybe this is part of the sequence. So we could go back and we could discuss maybe g3 is the move to include before. Then you play mm -hmm. 91. But... You have to do something, right? Because let's say you play rook b2, you attack the pawn on uh, on b5. Let's say black even plays b4. Now, the big question is how it's better for white? I don't get it. I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, I don't understand the bar. What do you do next? Yeah, I really don't understand. <laughs> like, it, it seems to me that black is just having a very pleasant position. Like, many of our viewers might ask, like, really? This is double pawns on, on B file, and we know that the double pawns usually are not the greatest pawns. But also, on the other hand, white has this pawn on D4, which limit so many white pieces, right? And right. get so much energy from white to guard this pawn. Uh, so, and also, additionally, why this is good to have double pawns on B file is that you have A file for the rook. So white rook cannot go far from second rank as black can attack this pawn at any time. And I also think that black can afford uh, to include moves like king g7, you know, just in mm -hmm. case, remove the king from the final rank, protect the pawn on h6, then play bishop e7, just in case, slowly improve the position slowly but carefully improving the position while white is not having a clear plan and maybe that's why here Litting G is looking for some clarification exactly so she plays rook d2 with the idea to play d5 i mean she's definitely looking for some counter play here yeah that's that's the move i really like and now if you want to stop d5 and if you stop that with knight before or 97 then you're gonna drop the pawn on b7 you definitely don't want to do that and the question is how we're going to stop this pawn. There's also bishop to b b4 to attack the rook on d2. Let's say here, rook d1, your pawn on h6 is under attack. We might, yeah. we might trade it, by the way. Take. Take. And whatever. Oof. I would be so scared here with white to go against b pawns. Maybe it's not going anywhere, really. I don't know. This this game can heat um, up very fast. Also, what is how thinking about, about bishop? Oh, I like that idea. Yeah, I was thinking about bishop a5, bishop b6 uh, from very, very beginning to get this bishop in here. But now, as you just mentioned, bishop g5, bishop f6, and h5, that's something uh, really attractive here for white. Let's say here, here, here. 
bishop to f6. Let's say you ignore what's happening. A h5. Uh, you see the bar is immediately raising because the idea is h6, h7, rook h1, and checkmate on h8. So not so simple also for black. Maybe it's not really a good idea to give up the pawn on h6. So what was it? Bishop b4, rook b1. And if I play king g7, there's d5. Right. This should be okay for white. I mean, if you manage to eliminate this uh, slightly weakened pawn on d4 and play d5, establish a pawn majority at the king side, you have a chance to do something good at king side where you have the pawn majority. So end game should be pretty good for white. Yeah, seems like. Okay, rook to d2, and it's taking some time. I I would expect here like five minutes at least for mana to to invest here in this position. Arthur, what do you think about knight a5 idea to get this knight on c4 square? This is the square that knight can also go for. Bishop c6 is something that we're looking for. And if white pushes d5 now, uh, we do have this knight c4, very unpleasant move, right? Knight c4, kicking this rook from second rank, now take on d5. Yeah, and take on d5, rook a8. I think we can keep the knight on, on c4. The bishop on e3 is something that has not played so far, right? Right. Takes I don't know. Take with a bishop, bishop and rook a8. Rook a8. Okay, maybe I have to take with the rook so that there's bishop b1. Mm -hmm. Here and bishop b1. Uh, yeah, and now I think bishop c6 makes a lot of sense. Yeah, black is definitely very active. Yeah, so the pawn on e5 in some lines already is getting under attack. Bishop g7, mm -hmm. uh, black has incredibly active pieces. So that's a great plan, by the way. So what was it once again? Knight a5, right? Knight a5, yeah. Very logical move. But then again, you know, uh, maybe knight a... Oh, what did I do? <laughs> Sorry, my bad. <laughs> So maybe knight f5 is a good move. But again, we have to imagine ourselves in Anna's shoes, right? I think she mainly wants to play knight before knight e5 and bishop c6. Maybe I'm wrong. And when you have that idea and you're desperately looking yeah. towards to get the knight on d5, it's difficult subtly to go, yeah. Yeah, to go on the edge that. of the board. But I guess we are gonna see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that actually. But my uh um I think that she will go for knight f5. She will go for knight f5. Um, and uh, she's going to try to look. Because I have played against Anna, and she's very resourceful. And she's a very, very dangerous player. And if you give even an entirely little chance to her, she's going to so use that chance. So. Um, yeah, I, I kind of, I kind of think that if she, yeah, she's going for knight a five. She played it, yeah. Position. Yeah, let's see, let's see. Um, Not yet. She our chat play. says that this bishop is sleeping. Bishop, I think the bishop on e three. That's what what he mentioned, and kind of thinking now the time difference. Yeah, and I think uh, our American viewers are having now night time. Um, no, 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 no. They have, uh, uh, they're behind us. Morning time. Yeah, they have morning, morning time. time. They're morning time. Morning so time. It's okay. Europe. Europe is always ahead. Yeah, they think uh, the time time situation for chess players is very, very important because uh, Arthur probably have also played in the tournaments where time was different and you couldn't really adjust it. Like, for instance, there was World Championship uh, in the youth category in Vietnam, and I could not adjust time for one week. It was like six hours difference. And the time when I was falling asleep, it was morning already, six in the morning. So it was very hard. I was struggling. And um, here, I know that Slay came uh, five days earlier than the first round to adjust the uh, time, to adjust the, the climate here, because it's really hot in Monaco compared to, to China and many other places. So, so that's that's very nice uh, for, for these players that they can afford to come here some time before and uh, to adjust the whole situation, t sleeping schedule as well. It just shows the professional attitude, really. So yeah. it, it's, it's a good idea, of course, uh, to arrive 
a tournament when you're crossing continents. I also have done it not not uh, too many times. I've uh, been mm-hmm. in myself in the United States and Australia, and uh, every single time I would arrive like at least several days before to avoid this jet lag because the first day or two days you're just not comprehending anything at all, right? Especially when you're crossing yeah. like a lot of time zones and. Yeah, then it's then it's incredibly incredibly difficult. Yeah, it is. It wouldn't be hard for Anna and Maria because they they came from uh, from Spain, as I know. It's a t- same time uh, time zone, Central European time. Um, but for Lane, for uh, for also Connery Humphrey, that's uh, that's huge time difference. For her, it would be uh, already like uh, almost midnight, right? I mean, in uh, China and India, in they're in, they're ahead India, of India. So it's already yeah. late night, and that's why, of course, it's very important to be ahead of uh, uh, the, uh, the games, to be there present. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, some people might might ask the question, why this is so important? But guys, it's so important because in, uh, in the case of chess players and also all the players, like there is some certain time when your brain starts the fast work, like hard work. And it's pretty much depends how, what's your schedule, right? If you are not used to work from early morning, then you need some more time to wake up and your brain is not very happy to start work I think I think, Kathy, so. the chess players in general, they are just not getting used to work from the morning. I, I haven't seen a single player who is enjoying playing a morning game at 9 or 10 a.m. Everybody is complaining oh, no. as far as I know. Yes. You can see 100 grumpy faces in the in the playing when you including myself and I I think you too. <laughs> Everybody just enjoys very good sleep, morning sleep, right? Yeah. Yeah. Chess players are that's, owls that's by right. definition. But also our schedule is like uh, most of the players are spending at least two hours before they round for the preparation. And when you have rounded nine in the morning, when you wake up like at seven to have preparation, that's crazy. You also need a good sleep, right? So uh, right. yeah, time time schedule and to when the tournament starts are so important. But I know, Arthur, that um, uh, tournaments in Asia, most of the Asian countries, they are starting rather early. I think the earliest uh, I've seen actually is 7 a.m. somewhere. Don't ask me where. 7 a.m. That's insane. Why? Where? I don't know. Don't ask me why. It's some some open tournament. It's seven a.m. I I played their last game eight a.m. <laughs> what? Uh, naturally, my brain was sleeping at, until at least ten a.m. So there was nothing I could do. So. You can't. You can bring pillow <laughs> and sleep between terrible. the games. Oh wow! Um, actually, we have I guess a lot of uh, viewers from America who. Or who have like most of them have this kind of tournament from Friday and then weekend and three games in one day, which is crazy. Maybe that's where they start to play early morning. They have, <laughs> they have to, they have to, I guess, to start. Otherwise, when you're gonna finish, yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a good idea. But three games, yeah. Yeah, three that, games. That's too much. So you're out of luck. Mm-hmm. In Europe, yeah. we have two games maximum. And then we're complaining two days about that. So, <laughs> All right, what is happening in this game? There is no moves. I mean, it's... Give us the moves. <laughs> Give us the moves. There's there's no action. So after Rook D2 here, Anna Mozuchuk is trying to, you know, squeeze something out. Again, the match strategy mm-hmm. for her probably is like, she played the Grunfeld here to equalize. And now she probably is getting ambitious because she likes her position. I think the body language says she's all about business and she has more time on the clock, 27 minutes. So are we going to see some real action very fast? Like 95. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these two knight moves, we kind of feel that knight should move around. Because earlier we said that like about there is also king g7 or bishop e 7 But Arthur, if now black goes for bishop e 7 or king g7, actually king g7 maybe first, then what happens after d5? Let's check that out. I guess some trades. Um, <clears throat> take it. Bishop d5. I think white is just fine. 
put the bishop on b3, protect the pawn on e5, and uh, if somebody can get worse in this endgame, I think it's actually black, for example, something like this. Uh, now this pawn is stopping these two pawns, and white has chances to organize some sort of a pawn majority uh, past pawn at a king side. So I don't think that Anna, in any scenario, is going to love it. That's right. That's right. I Actually, think... our uh, our viewers are suggesting a move which is very interesting, like to play rook to a8 now. Okay. We need we need uh, an extension. Five. We need an extension. What was it? This a levy, uh, and a uh, Gotham chess and Hikaru extension. Do you have it? I think when you play on chess.com, yeah. you get like a verbal uh, announcement. Make a move. <laughs> have you had it? No. <laughs> No. <laughs> uh, you, you play online. I mean, on chess.com, yeah. obviously. And if you don't make a move, like, in the next 10 seconds, you can set up, I, I think, the time. Then there's the automatic response, various responses, where uh, I think it was Gotham Chess and Hikaru Nakamura, they announced, make a move, make a move. Come on, come on, make a move. It's really fun. Oh, that's no? so cool. I want that. But it's for you, right? It's kind of like, it's like un... alerts. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Or to your opponent. No, not, not to your No, opponent. no, it's like, for you. Would it's you? for you. It's for you. Yeah. So okay. that you're getting... When the opponent is thinking, it's like something that uh, you would never like... <laughs> No, continue to 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 think. I will leave the board. Take your time. Enjoy your time. No, it's think when deeper. you are thinking. When you are thinking. Okay. There's a move. She moved knight to a five. There we go. You're a prophet. Knight a five is played, which is the most logical move. Preparing to play knight c four, bishop c six, and. D5 actually might not be a great choice here for Leiting G. Now the question is, is she going to make a mistake here? Because after D5, we have Knight C4 attacking the Rook here on D2. And after Rook D1, I think it was... Uh, help me here. Takes, yeah. <laughs> what was it? Take on D5, Bishop D5 and Rook A8. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> yeah. This is the game that Black and for sure... Get something out of it. Is there some something else? Is not if not d five? Uh, definitely. Uh, I don't think that uh, White is obliged to do this. But the threat of knight c four and the more annoying threat, at least visually looking, bishop c six looks scary. And I think that White wants to simplify. White wants to clarify. So d five is mm -hmm. a very natural response, but it might not be the best choice. So if you don't do that, what do you do? Your clock is ticking. Tick tock, tick tock. This is move twenty four. She has sixteen minutes for sixteen moves. You're starting to feel some heat here. Yeah, you definitely do. And uh, imagine if we have like low time on the clock, five minutes for each player. This is a different game, indeed totally different game Arthur, i would um, i would like to check what is happening after for instance uh some waiting move like knight, let's do rook to b2 okay uh so if you push b4 here no i'm not going to gonna push it's space not, advantage it's not under attack even yeah, yeah if you if you push that then there's knight to d2 right and your knight will never get on c4 i'm trying to get my knights uh, out of this f3 square so this is a good position so if you bring knight on c4 now I can go rook to c2, keep this rook on second rank. And then I want to play knight to d2 anyway and get rid of your knight on c4. Okay. And what if I, I don't play knight c4? I play bishop c6. Mm -hmm. You play knight d2 I anyway? I think knight d2 anyway, yeah. Huh. And if I play something like rook a8? Mm, rook to e8. I don't know what I'm even threatening. Oh. I guess some take and knight c4. Yeah, I think I would personally go rook to c2 just to make sure that knight will never go on c4 for the moment. Or maybe it's not even necessary. In knight d2 now. Maybe. Yeah, this is definitely an option. So black can play rook a4 to keep the knight there. After knight c4, b takes, b5. 
is a possibility. The bar says, of course, white is better. I mean, why not? Uh, yeah. But again, I mean, it's a bit difficult for white to make moves. Maybe white has to understand there's nothing better than just sit and do nothing. Rook b2, rook c2, knight e2, etc. Yeah, by the way, the knight from c6 is gone, so the pressure on the d4 pawn is gone. But I can easily see late g pushing b5. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And also, uh, yeah, I, I do like this because rook b2, rook c2, still a lot of pieces are on the board. That's also possible, though. Like rook c2 now with id rook c7, next move. 30 minutes on the clock for white. And I think this is a very good moment for Anna to unleash a very good stare. Try to intimidate the opponent. <laughs> Give another look. <laughs> Give another look. <laughs> yeah. There Let's take go. a let's take a closer look if we can and full bring the full camera and see once again different Anna. Another Anna that we, we saw yesterday. Uh yeah, look at this. This is the face of a chess player who knows that I uh, have chances to win this game and i need to use this chance and on the other hand we have Leiting g who is not happy at all we remember her how uh how uh free it was her um gestures and the body language yesterday she goes rook to c2 in fact i think this is your move i think or was it rook b2 no it was rook b2 uh, yeah i like both rook c2 rook. just to keep rook on the second rank Rook c2 makes perfect sense because white is preparing knight e2, knight b3, I guess. So the knight on uh, f3 no longer is uh, sitting there. So can we play bishop c6 here? Do we want to play bishop c6? Maybe we don't want to play because I assume we are still being ambitious here. Maybe we can play b4. By the way, b4, bishop b5, bishop c4, or bishop a4 ideas. Try to trade this pawn and organize the best pawn of which is one of the key ideas of the ground file. So what about b4 here? Can I do this? Knight two. Here? And bishop b5 check, I guess? Yeah, check. Big check. So you go here. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. And now plays a very smart move. I just need to find it. Maybe like knight c6, attacking this pawn. You play knight b3. I play. OK, I'm running out of moves. <laughs> yeah, like uh, I think out of all this maneuvering that we have, White made a good deal here to get this knight from f3 to b3, because White has more, uh, like it guards the pawn indeed, same uh, same task, but then you have c5 square, sometimes a5 square, and just to uh, to open up the f-file for pawns, because you, you don't know, maybe White will start to push the pawns on the uh, king side when whites stabilize the things on this in the center right right uh, and when black bought the bishop on uh, b5 that's uh, okay not big improvement it's not d5 square right mm -hmm. big moment like any other moment in this game for anna to make a choice By the way, rook c7 yeah. is also a threat, right? At some point, so you need to deal with that. It's not like you can afford to play something slow as king g7. So bishop c6 could be a move. And after the take, maybe knight c6. All right. I'm trying to understand what is this position, not to allow the white knight to jump to um b3 hmm. and again i want to play b4 at some point okay let's go for g3 here for white and when you play b4 um oh no i can i wanted to play king to d3 and then king to e4 i love this king to be centralized there but look at this uh arthur if we go b4 now okay and then king d3 there is b3 move oh which i don't like at all 
I think Black is going to like it really much. The big point is mm -hmm. 8x on b3, knight b4 is a fork. Black wins something. This can be easily missed winning time trouble. Uh, and I think also Black's idea could be something like rook a8, rook a3, b3 to organize this pass pawn and do it the way so that the knight is not ready to jump to b3. But how do you do it even? I have no idea. Maybe some smart moves like king g7, bishop e7 first, protect the pawn on h6. So the maneuvering part of this game is not yet over. We, we're still there. We're still there. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if bishop... Right. I'm not sure about this bishop c6. It's definitely a move which is one of the top choices in Anna's mind. But do you, do you remove the tension? Maybe you want to keep the tension because I think she has... Uh, convinced herself that she is pushing. Uh, I think we also convinced ourselves that uh, she is yeah. slightly pushing. And that's why after bishop c6, although black removes this bishop from e4, uh, it also becomes a bit easier for white to play. And maybe she's trying to, you know, use the fact that she has 22 minutes on the clock, the opponent has 30 minutes, and the opponent already shuffling the pieces here and there and waiting for something to happen. So bishop c6... Maybe it's not necessary. I, I I don't know. But then again, what do you do against rook c7 threat? Yeah, well, bishop c6 stops rook to come on f uh, on c7, right? Right. Um, so, yeah, that's the main reason. That's the main reason. And if you trade these bishops, um, I'm okay to get rid of the white bishop on e4, which makes so much problem on b7 pawn. So... If she goes bishop to c6, I think that's still fine. And if I start to be smart, I play rook a8. With the idea to invite your rook on c7 so that now I can play bishop c6. And try to disconnect your rook from the game because I have knight c4. Yeah, I see the bar. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe not a great yeah. idea. I tried to make knight c4, rook a2 idea work and organize this pass pawn, trade the c6 pawn for the a2 pawn. You have this oh, outside. Oh, Arthur, pass. something yeah. is going on. They are repeating the moves. After knight c6, Anna decided to play knight to c6. They are repeating the moves they made already. No, no. How many moves? No, 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 don't do it. <laughs> because I think Lady G is going to agree. She is going to agree for the repetition. I don't think. Yeah. That's it. Ooh, <laughs> they are calling for the arbiter. So the rule is, guys, you have to write down the move, call the arbiter. That that is unexpected. That is three times repetition. Here we had a hand shake and the smile as well. It was a great draw. So I think Lay is happy for for this draw. They are sharing the score sheets now and Arthur I am 100% sure now that Anna is going to the direction of the tie breaks and she wants to do that you think so really so early maybe maybe uh you know uh Kerry, I I have a feeling that she simply decided that uh she's not gonna risk it so see mm -hmm. she's a very pragmatic player and uh she probably had an idea that she's slightly pushing. Uh, where was this? Uh, about, about, about here. Okay, maybe she didn't have those ideas. So we were trying to imagine that she has. So you could feel that maybe Black is a bit more ambitious. And after a couple of moves, she realized, I mean, it's not really going anywhere. And the opponent is willing to repeat the position. And she thought, okay, okay. I mean, uh, yeah. for the match strategy, this is good. To remind you, there is... Uh, a mini match system in the uh, pool A and all of the pools. So the players are fighting out. You see, here's the bracket. Uh, they're playing out four games of the mini match, of the mini match, uh, four classical games. And uh, if the score is tied, then we take it on to the tie breaks. So from uh, the Ukrainian grandmaster's perspective, this was a good choice. She didn't see how she's going to continue. And probably if she would have overpressed and lost the game, she could blame her sell herself later, right? So she's happy with the draw. Yeah. And of course, so is also white. Yeah, let's get back to the uh, playing venue. And uh, we have a very interesting comment in the in our chat about 
saying for the first time when there is some uh, post game analysis, and I was actually thinking the same way because we don't very often say, especially in the match, in very important match, when there's only two players that they are discussing after the game because usually, like at the World Championship match, we do have same opening mostly, and we have slightly improvements after each game and they are repeating the, uh, the, the the same openings right and at this tournament Anna Muzicic asked to Lei a question I think Lei was a bit confused at the beginning they had the conversation which was quite long and uh, I was just wondering what they were thinking what they were talking what which was the part they were analyzing maybe in the last part for instance, like I could, Anna could keep it go and uh, keep it play, and she was probably interesting. What was Lay's idea? How to to defend it? Because sometimes, Arthur, you have something in your mind, and then you end the game in a draw, and then you're you you know that your opponent was planning to do something else where you had better position. So sometimes that happens to you, but so uh, it's. Not right. happening very often that the players are discussing. I I have I have the a game. theory. I have a theory, Kelly. I, I think mm -hmm. everybody really badly wants to follow the Global Chess Championship finals in Toronto, <laughs> and that's also the reason why the game finished today early, so that everybody, yes. <laughs> literally everybody, can go over to the main channel of Chess.com and follow the exciting action of the best players in the world fighting for what was this uh, a million prize for or was it in the final half a million i don't remember it's an incredible tournament chess.com has done an absolutely incredible job to make it happen and uh this is where you're going to be most likely heading after this game because uh, that's one of the sure. main attractions of chess.com's uh, impressive list of tournaments i believe they're starting <laughs> either right now or they're about to start with some of the best they have started already arthurs and i have to admit that during our four minutes break i was observing the games in the global chess championship guys for sure you do know but if you just join now the twitch and you have no idea what's going on then this is something for you so the global chess championship is happening right now this is the tournament first time ever where we have one million dollar prize fund we have top grandmasters top eight grandmasters and also we have a star a commentary team a lot of a lot of streamers a lot of commentators that you know and you follow and also fabiano caruana well-known chess figure he's also um uh, one of the uh, commentators of the tournament and you definitely don't want want to miss any second of that and i think we're gonna do the same too uh right after finishing this coverage just to go to the Chesco main channel and uh, observe the situation what's going on there so arthur i think we can call it a day thank you so much for being a uh, partner in crime for these two days i think that's it for us and from to not tomorrow but the day after and last around we're gonna have um another team of the commentators joining the event tomorrow it will be day off uh for the participants in uh monaco and let's see what this day off brings us um maybe some exciting openings maybe same old openings we don't know we have to turn in and observe that so thank you so much arthur thank you uh to our viewers who are here with us even though that there is very challenging tournament for them going on at the same time and also a whole chesscom team to put this coverage together and uh broadcast it so i think final words goes to you arthur and uh, we can just call it today. well yeah absolutely it was an absolute pleasure to be here for the past two days together with you katie and everybody else who was watching this so once again thank you for watching this the woman candidates tournament is not all tomorrow there's a rest day as already Kerry said uh there's gonna be the coverage again on November 4 with some of the best female commentators uh, uh available and now I think we are saying goodbye and you 
probably will get traded to the chess.com's main channel. Enjoy the action from the Global Chess Championship, but don't forget to tune in in the following days also for the Women Candidates Tournament to determine who is going to challenge the world champion, Juve Jun. Thank you. Goodbye. Namaste. Adios, amigos. Bye-bye.